All right, good afternoon, delegates. We shall reconvene convention. I certainly hope you all enjoyed your lunch, and I think now is the time to actually acknowledge the Convention Center for all their hard work over our convention and for the great food. So I've got a couple of announcements to make, and then I'm going to turn the chair back over to Janet to continue on with our elections. So, okay, we've got to, thank you, brother. Microphone one. Uh, point of privilege, my name is Teresa Menzies. I'm the president of um, Local 73, Red River College. Um, I'm glad that, Madam Goronsky, you are addressing me because um, two things. Um, one pertains to the comment you just made about um, thanking the convention um, center staff. I might beg um, the uh, request that next year or two years or three years, whenever the next convention is, two or three years from two, now, two. Could, could we please have an additional four inches between the tables? Sister, I've been hearing that a lot, so thank you, Teresa. Yes. The, the space allocation in the room is a little tight. I think there might be some safety issues regarding that. And the six square feet that I have inhabited this weekend is eight inches short of six square feet, and I, I beg for the extra eight inches, please. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Noted. The only other comment, if I might, is um, just to summarize um, something that I have learned at this uh, convention, and that is that the next time I am on a weekend tour and I stop into many liquor stores, I can blame that <laughs> as union business. Is that what I heard you say? As long as you do not partake of the refreshment, sister. <laughs> you know, as soon as it came out of my mouth, I thought, oops, it doesn't sound so good, maybe. But, but thank you for that. Brother on microphone three, please. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I just want to do a little point of privilege. Um, we all get elected to come here to represent the interests of our brothers and sisters in our workplaces. I, I attended the All Candidates Forum yesterday, and I was pretty disappointed to see at least a third of this room not there. These candidates put their ass on the line they are up there putting everything out for everybody to, to do what they want with it, and people don't even have the courtesy to sit and attend to hear them out. It's shameful. Thank you, with that in mind, with that in mind, folks, I think that in future conventions, we should be looking at ha having the All Candidates Forum just after lunch, so everybody's here, and they can make an educated proper guess. I know a lot of people come in already having a decision made, but those people put it all on the line, and we are here to represent our members, not what we're told to do or whatever, but we should be listening and hearing them out. Thank you. Thank you for that, brother. Duly noted. And just on that, when you say that, I had another brother came up, and I was just sharing with him the 400 of us, or not quite 400 of us, we are representing 40,000 people. Every time we make a decision, every time we move forward on something, we are representing 40,000 people. Usually it's with their spouses, their families, their friends. So what we do here is important. It is not to be played with and it's not just a weekend away. We make decisions here that impact people's lives and we should be very proud of the decisions we make and how we move forward. It's democracy at its finest. Thank you for that, brother. Brother on microphone four. Thank you. Point of privilege, please. Um, I'm Constant Cook with Local 54 Trades. Yes. Um, I was just speaking with some of the brothers and sisters about... Uh, our votes and how they're shown as percentages, I think it would be a better situation if we could show the actual votes. And I've got an announcement on that one. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Sister on microphone four. 
Thank you, Michelle. Um, my name is Michelle. Yeah, welcome, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Michelle Skabinski, Local 33, Area 7, and I just rise her point of uh, privilege, please. I just want to let everybody know we've had great uh, conversation and on the resolutions that have taken place through this weekend, um, but we have a government out there. I don't think that's listening. And uh, we now have an avenue that maybe we can get them to listen to. There are pre-budget consultation meetings going on throughout the province. Pardon me. <clears throat> you can go to the Government of Manitoba website and find out. And as a matter of fact, on Thursday, October 25th, at the, con or at the uh, legislation building, we can all show up and let them know what we think. Uh, you do have to pre-register. Um, but all that information is on the government website. And I just want to just let everybody know that, you know what, we have done this before. Show up in your MGU t-shirts and you can sit there and even not say anything. You don't have to go up to a mic, but you know, a silenced presence, silent presence says a lot as well. So sister, thank you very, very thank much you. because I am registered to be there and I would be so proud if everyone in this room or everyone that was in Winnipeg that day, those that have the time, please do wear your t-shirt. Join me at the ledge and we will do a little walkthrough. And I will be your voice again. Unless you want to register, that would be awesome too. The more voices, the better. But Sister Michelle, thank you so much for that. Please join me, everyone. I will be there that day. We'll find out the times and it'll be up on our website. I'm sure. Yes, I'm looking over at the boss. Yes. Okay, so thank you very, very much. And we have a sister on microphone three. Yes, thank you, Michelle. Carolyn Crawford, 113 Home Care. A great convention. But? But. <laughs> Parking. Parking is extremely expensive. I don't think it's fair. We're coming downtown. We're bringing our business down here. Something needs to be done about it. If we can bring over 300 people into this place, then surely we can do something about the cost of parking. I just paid $14 to get out of this parking lot I just paid $7 to park on the street. This is ridiculous. Transportation, I am on a limited income because I'm not working right now. So maybe I'm not the only one that's here in that position, but I really think something has to be done. Either we start carpooling, we Victoria N. Mar Marlene is suggestion. So that's my beef. And thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you very much. And duly noted, I'm not sure who we'd speak to. Uh, I understand there might be an election happening in the next few days. We might have to remind folks about the cost of private parking. Thank you so much. Um, no other speakers on mics. So for this evening, I'm going to do the first one, this one first. Um, we are going to be enjoying the banquet together, and there's going to be good food, I know that, and there's going to be some good drink. So uh, we want everyone to have a good time together, and, but we also want to make sure that everybody makes it home safely. So we would ask that all delegates attending the banquet who are not staying at the hotel know that if you're going to be drinking this evening, please take a cab home and put it in on your expenses. It is very, very important that everybody gets home safely tonight. Let's be responsible. Uh, as for Brother Constance, thank you for that one. As for the numbers and the percentage, there has been some, some discussion and some requests from delegates that we're a, we're, we show both, so we are indeed going to do that. We're going to be able to show the numbers difference, and then for folks like me who can't add and subtract off the top of my head, they're going to give me the percentage so that I know if it's a 66 or if it's a 50% plus one. So we're going to have both up there, folks, and that'll cover that off. Uh, they've asked me to remind the delegates that please, the electronic voting device, when you're done, the clicker, 
please give it to reception on your way out. Uh, otherwise, we end up having to buy them and we won't have use for them later on. So please do that. Uh, sister came up and showed me that there's been a bit of a typing error on the evaluation sheet under the electronic voting. It has two fours instead of one four and a five. So if you could just turn your second four onto a five and fill it out, but at least there you know that it is a type error. Thank you so much. I got a speaker on mic one. Thank you. Hey, Chris. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan Lipson, local 256. I actually, the sister had the, the issue of the parking, but I had a question about that because yeah. do we not claim that on our expense form as well? Yes. Okay. Yes, we do. So we won't have yeah. to worry about that. I think the sister's kind of looking at it that, you know, perhaps if there's going to be extra cost, if there's a way that we can be fiscally responsible with our dues. So Certainly. recognize that one. But yes, of course, you do put your, your parking on your expenses. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I heard you, sister. Yes, you know what? And that's right. There are times it's really hard for some of the folks that are, you know, financially to have to put the money out, to have to wait for it to come back, can be a bit of a challenge. So, you know, maybe there's a way that we can be looking at this for the next convention. These are all good things to hear. I'm not making anybody any promises because we're not sure where things are going to land, but I know that our, our convention committee that does look after this stuff, they're hearing it too and they will definitely be taking things into consideration. So thank everybody for coming up to the mics to talk and I recognize a sister on mic one. Thank you, Cheryl Santilli, uh, first time speaker. Woo! Um, MPI uh, Local 67. Uh, just, I wanted to make a point of clarification about the parking. Um, just very recently, without notice, everything went up downtown. The City Place Parkade went up from $9.25 a day to $13. Mm -hmm. uh, the city place, uh, that's the one that's attached to the city place building, which MPI owns. Then there's a city place parking, which is separate, just across from MTS Center, went up to $13 a day from eight fifty, And this all went without notice. So I hear what you're saying about the parking. It's skyrocketed within the last three weeks. And it has come up in our workplace because now our employees, when we work in a contact center till 7.15, which, and a lot of them are 8.30, 9 o'clock with the brokers, they've gone from paying roughly uh, $12 a day. They're not paying almost $20 a day when they're working past the 6 o'clock point. So just a point of clarification, it's gone up everywhere downtown. Thank you, sister. And I think I hear a proposal in there because I think your group's going to the table soon. So if MPI does own the buildings and they own the parkade, thank you for that. Sister on mic one. Hi, I'm Camille Berthelet, uh, Area 1, Local 69, from the University College of the North. Um, I'd just like to uh, put a recommendation. Uh, perhaps we should be looking at uh, the Assiniboi Downs as a venue. Uh, I attend the Manitoba Métis Federation Annual General Assembly yearly, and that place can hold over 2,000 people. There is no parking. Um, it, well, there's free parking. Pardon me. <laughs> you get it. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking from a cost saving, like you got, looking at the costs, you know, I, we're spending $178 a night on a hotel to stay downtown. And then you throw the parking on it. And I understand we do get reimbursed. But perhaps we should look at different venues and different avenues. Yeah. Thank That's you all. for that, Thank sister. You. I know that the committee definitely does take a look and they shop around. So, uh, in fact, if I remember correctly, within about 10 days, our uh, convention committee actually starts looking for the two years from now. So they start booking stuff right away. So thank you for the suggestion. Uh, Larissa, one. oh, sorry. Uh, Larissa, um, Area 7, Red River College, uh, two things. Number one, don't forget about green transportation. Victoria and Assiniboine Downs have either limited or no bus service. And uh, can we move on to election? We are going to do that right now. Thank you, Larissa. All right. No other speakers at the mics. Thank you, everyone, for that one. And I turn it over to Janet. If folks have further announcements, um, please feel free to use the registration desk and we can read them out uh, throughout the course of events or at, at the beginning or end. And if you have additional suggestions, which is great about convention, 
uh, on your evaluation forms, please feel free to write those in there and we'll take those into account. And I'll just share with you one of the things that we also look at is which uh, facilities are unionized and which are not. So that sometimes limits a few options as well. Having said all that, I would like to call the nominators and candidates forward for the position of third vice president. to give my boss the boot. <laughs> and again, I'll just remind the delegates that we drew for the order of speakers. And so I am gonna invite Kimberly Lynn to come up first. Thank you very much. Sorry, good morning. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. My name is Kimberly Lynn, and I'm a proud MG member and activist. I stand here today to tell you about an amazing union sister that I am proud to call my friend. I'm talking about Shannon Reynolds, and she is running to be your third vice president. If you read Shannon's bio, you already know that she has been a proud MGU member and activist for 11 years now. She served the MGU in a number of roles. Correctional officer for area three, four, and seven. Probation officer in area two. Social Sciences Component Director, Stuart Roll in Area 4, member of the Winnipeg Labour Council, member of the Women's Committee, Vice President and President of her Area 2 Local, member of the, Cons the Constitution, Bylaw and Structure Committee, and member facilitator for member education. To add to this, she's a sister, mother, wife, grandmother, and she managed to finish her degree in sociology and political science while being a very active MGU member for us. She is open-minded, caring, empathetic individual that anyone would be proud to have serving on their executive board. Shannon is also a great community activist. She participated in the Polar Plunge for Special Olympics a couple of years ago, and very recently in the drop zone for Easter Seals that was rappelling down the Manitoba Hydro Building, not something that I'd be doing for her. And most notably, she organized a dinner for the October 4th Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women's Vigil in Swan River. She called it, we are all sisters, we are all one. She made the food herself, she booked a hall, nicely MGU sponsored the hall for her, and she invited Chief Sheila North Wilson, who came and spoke eloquently on such a sad subject for us. Shannon did this out of the kindness of her heart. A few friends volunteered to help her cook and bake, and a few others offered a little money for the supplies, but the vast majority of this event came out of Shannon's pocket and heart. She expected nothing in return, just appreciated being a part of such a significant night. She spe this speaks volume of her character. She is not quick to judge, gives things sound, careful consideration, is solution oriented, and would give the shirt off her back if you needed it. We have served on the MGU Board of Directors together. She did not always agree on things that came across the table, but she listened openly, asked questions, and voted from a place of knowledge. She always has 40,000 members in mind when she casts the ballot. She takes her director role very seriously and understands that sometimes it puts her on the opposite side of other members, but she doesn't let that cloud her judgment. She votes from a position of strength in her ability to ask the tough questions before she casts her vote. She truly believes what she says, that the strength of this union lies within our diversity and our membership engagement. She will listen to you and your ideas, and you have the opportunity to write those ideas on the back of the postcards that she left on your tables. Through diversity, new concepts and ideas are developed, and in turn, membership, education, and empowerment is improved. With these principles as a guide, she commits to working with the membership education staff to conserve all members have a voice. Close, by the way, so close. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the people of Treaty 1, whose land we are gathered on today, as well as the Métis in their homeland. I'd also like to thank Sister Lynn for her kind words and support. Thank you. When we proudly say we are the MGU, what does this mean? Well, Webster's defines a labor union as an organization of workers formed for the purpose of advancing its members' interests. For me, this is the all-for-one and one-for-all spirit of our union. It's what gives us strength 
and why I believe there is no sector, component, area, local, or member that is more important than any other. Because it is not just that we are the MGU, it is that we are all the MGU. We are a diverse group, and I believe understanding our diversity is necessary to engage and represent our members in a meaningful way. And when we're able to do this, we gain. We gain the knowledge of our members' needs, their issues, their interests, and their ideas. From this knowledge, we can develop innovative plans and policies, which in turn increase our membership engagement and strengthen our union. But diversity refers to more than gender, race, and religion. We are baby boomers, Gen X, millennials, Gen Z. We have a multitude of differences. Look around the room. We have different occupations, shifts, work demands. We live in different communities, have different family dynamics and pressures. So how do we facilitate meaningful engagement with our members? Simple, really. We ask them. Because a union is member-driven, and it is the membership who decides the direction of our union. We ask them for their ideas, what's important to them, what courses they would like to take, and if there are different ways to deliver those courses in order to make them more accessible. We need to accept as well that not everyone will be able to make the same time commitments or have the same level of engagement, and that's okay, because meaningful engagement is qualitative, not quantitative. It requires all of us to not only state that diversity is an important aspect of our union, but to accept it with an open mind and know that when we truly engage our members in this way, it is meaningful and will foster new ideas. In turn, these ideas will ensure that our union is representative of all of our members. During this convention, it has been our responsibility to debate consider with an open mind, and vote on a variety of resolutions. Today, we all have the responsibility of electing the provincial officers. Some of us will meet tomorrow and elect our component directors. And soon, some of us will go to our area council to elect our area directors. Whoever we choose to elect, they will have the honor and responsibility of making decisions on our behalf, including debate and decisions regarding the resolutions referred to the Board of Directors and not heard at this convention. As we cast our ballots, I'm asking all of us to think about who we choose to elect. Will they be open-minded in the interests of all our members? Will they listen and engage in meaningful debate? Will they solicit, consider, and incorporate the diverse needs of our members when making decisions? Will they be solution-driven? If elected as your third vice president, I commit to honoring these principles. As outlined in my bio, I have served in various capacities as an activist. I've worked and lived in different areas. I understand the importance and value of diversity and being open-minded to new ideas and points of view in order to foster membership engagement and facilitate solutions. In this political climate, I believe this is what the MGEU needs to stay strong and grow stronger. What I expect from those I vote to represent us is to represent all of us, and I do not expect less of myself. I believe there should be no member left behind or felt ignored. I believe every voice matters, and I'm asking for your support, and of course your vote, to be our third vice president. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Amanda Russell, and I uh, have various roles in the social sciences component. It's once again my honor and privilege to nominate Shelley Wiggins for the position of third vice president. In the past two years, Shelley has been a diligent and tireless advocate for our members in her role as support to the Membership Education Committee, and more broadly in other activities of the union, including preparing for the upcoming intermingling health care votes. For those who don't know Shelley, she has been employed as a case counselor for the past 12 years with employment and income assistance in Swan River. She resides in Minnetonas with her husband and daughter. 
Shelley has a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Education degree and has previously been employed as a teacher in rural, remote, and urban settings. Prior to being elected into the position of third vice president, Shelley sat on the membership education committee for three consecutive terms and regularly facilitates MGU educational programs. Shelley has always been clear that she values education as a way to reach and support our fellow members and to provide people with a greater understanding of the reasons for the labor movement. Shelley values diversity and inclusion and has always been open to any constructive advice, mostly from me, that would make her more effective in her union roles. She also has fantastic shoes, so check them out. When I first met Shelley at the social sciences component, I found her a bit overwhelming. She is strong-minded and very detail-oriented, and her component reports were all, always the longest and most thorough I have ever seen. While I sometimes found the detail a bit much, it soon became very apparent that Shelley was listening to her members and able to pull out the issues they were facing as well as being able to see the patterns and themes that needed to be identified as areas of intervention by the board. Shelley continues to use these skills in her role as the third VP, and the same qualities that overwhelmed me at first have proven to be some of Shelley's strongest assets. I have always been amazed by Shelley's ability to see the larger picture at play, and in our current political climate, I feel this is an invaluable skill as we shape who we to define who the MGU is in a world that does not always understand the relevance of unions. I'm also struck by Shelley's willingness to pitch in, to assist with any task that is handed to her, and her ability to mentor others who want to build their skills. As a social worker, I value Shelley's kindness towards others who have, made, have struggles, and I have seen her extend respect and dignity to our most vulnerable clients, a skill set that is invaluable across all areas of her life. I thank you for your time today and again ask for your support in re-electing Shelley so she can continue to make a positive impact for all our members. Thank you. Not quite sure how I live up to that introduction. Thanks, Amanda. Brothers, sisters, siblings, friends, guests, thank you again for allowing me the opportunity to share with you my passion for advocacy, for learning, and education. It has been my honor to serve as your third vice president. During this term, we've achieved some of the goals of our strategic plan. We have increased the capacity of our membership to campaign and created new membership orientation materials, some of which I hope you were, had the chance to see at last night's expo. In response to a resolution from last convention and a motion from our Equality and Human Rights Committee, we are working to redevelop our cultural diversity course to be more inclusive of all equity-seeking groups. We are developing ways to enhance our local table officers' discussions to continue our local capacity building. As we continue to mobilize and organize our membership, we need to have the capacity to represent and educate our membership as well. Collectively, it is important to understand the roots of the labor movement and how the hard-won benefits that we often take for granted, and we've also heard this morning about how we feel we're losing those. We need to really hang on to that. We must reach out to those who do not have the representation of a union and also remind the public of the valuable roles unions play in our lives and our communities and the services that we provide. I firmly believe that knowledge is power and that knowledge is powerful. This power enables us to engage our membership by beginning the process of mentoring, it connects us with others through our shared values and by understanding the importance of being in a union. We need to know what it means to be an ally and an advocate, to take the skills that we learn in our courses, not only to help ourselves, but to help the greater community. I had such an opportunity at my own workplace to share information with my own clients about Manitoba's provincial domestic violence legislation that I had learned about at our women's conference. I was able to provide information to clients who struggle to maintain their rather precarious employment. Employment they need to make a better life for themselves and their families in moving towards independence. My clients did not know about the paid domestic violence leave that our union fought for, and they fought for this not only for our members, but for all Manitobans who may need it. This knowledge gave my clients the freedom of choice in a dark and potentially dangerous situation. It provided hope. We need to train our members so that they have the ability to do the same and share the, what they've learned with others. We need leaders from the next generations following us to continue the struggle. 
We want to engage our members and engage with our members so that we have an understanding of the issues. We cannot substitute ourselves as the leaders for the mass engagement of our members. We need to continue to work together to build a foundation on which we can stand up for our rights, to speak out against injustice. We need to change the message from one that frames unions as the culprits to one that shows how we can be part of a solution for the economic and social problems that our communities face. I'm asking for your support to continue as your third vice president. I'm committed to work with you, our members, with our board, our affiliates, our officers and our staff to advance our union's objectives, to create opportunities to learn, to mentor and to share that power of knowledge. I pledge to attend meetings, to meet with people, to listen, to share knowledge, ideas and information, to take every educational opportunity and to create those learning opportunities for others through our classrooms, through conversations and networking. I will continue to speak out on the issues to speak up for our members, to help facilitate opportunities to learn and develop, and to advocate for continuous lifelong learning. Membership education plays a key role in shaping our priorities. We have to continue to be actively involved in the MGU by attending meetings, becoming familiar with our collective agreements, our constitution, bylaws, and policies, and actively educating and encouraging our members to get involved. We need to work together to change our culture starting at the local level so that all of our members can understand that we are the union, that we are the MGEU. We need continued commitment so that we can mobilize, organize, represent and educate our membership. This way we can be more, sorry, this way we can move our union forward and continue working for the betterment of ourselves, our families, our workplaces and our communities. I would like to conclude with a quote from J.S. Woodsworth that summarizes what unionism is all about. He said, what we desire for ourselves we wish for all. Let's continue to work together so that everyone can enjoy the same benefits and rights. Let's make a difference. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'd like to ask the balloting committee to come forward. And if the sergeant at arms can ask the delegates in the hall to come back in and then tile the doors, please. For those of you that are getting out your balloting books, I'm going to choose number one. The blue one, the bright blue one. The names are posted behind me. Can I ask the balloting committee to show our delegates that the boxes are in fact empty? I'll remind everybody, just clearly indicate uh, the name on your ballot. And then once the scrutineers have had a chance to cast their ballot, if they can join Kevin at the back of the room. Uh, do we have a little problem? Un momento. Are we good? Okay, let's gather the ballots. And uh, once the folks up here have cast their ballots, you can take your seats. I will ask uh, the General Resolutions Committee, once you have had an opportunity to cast your ballot, if you could make your way up front. And I'll just remind the scrutineers to leave their cell phones behind. Have all of you up here cast your ballots? Yep. Have you
you guys cast her ballots? Yes, ma'am. She's Stephanie, too? Yeah, she cast her before she Can I have one of those? Oh, absolutely. I've got lots. How are you doing? I'm good, yeah. <laughs> I'm getting emails from all across Canada. I got two from South Africa. Oh, They've been watching my golf school with children in South Africa. Lovely. Has everyone's ballot been collected? If your ballot has not been collected, can I ask you to stand up or wave your hand wildly in the air? Is, is that a hand? Okay, it looks like we have the ballots. Sergeant at Arms, if you can untie all the doors. And our balloting committee will go away and count the ballots, and I will then turn the chair to President Goronsky. Thank you very much, Janet. So GR16, next resolution up. And I am going to turn to the committee, please. GR16, page 77. Okay, GR 16, the MGU will allow components to vote on staff representative reassignment to pass at 50% plus one of available voters at local meetings. The committee recommendation is re uh, one of rejection and the note that this resolution is out of order as this is a staffing issue. Uh, so moved. And second. Thank you very much. It's been moved and seconded by committee. Committee's recommendation is to reject with expl explanation. And we have a sister on microphone three. Sister? Deb Jamerson, legal, uh, local 26 and board. And I rise up in support of uh, the recommendation of rejection. In a perfect world. So I thought you would be at the green, but. <laughs> <laughs> you, did, you, you did have my heart pounding, Deb. <laughs> okay. Um, and one. the reason being is, is that in a perfect world, it would be really nice to have the people that we want representing us, okay? But ultimately, how do you choose? In Thompson, for example, where we have one staff rep. In, in Flin Flon and the Paul, where we only have one staff rep. You can't, you can't pick and choose those people that you want to represent you. Every one of our staff reps has the skill and the ability to do the job. And if there are serious issues, then they should be bringing that to the board, so we are, and to, and to, the, to Janet, um, to raise those issues. And that's key. Um, but pick and choosing just won't work in the, in the kind of jobs that these staff reps do. Thanks. Thank you, sister. Seeing a brother on mic one. Well, I'm Mike Bartell. I'm uh, from Area 7. Correct Mike, can you get a little closer to your... Thank you. Mike Bartell. I'm from uh, Area 7, Local 14. So I guess the question I would have would be, perhaps be defined as a point of order. And that is, um, if it's out of order, what is it doing in here? It should have not been here to start with. I'll look to the committee. <laughs> We had discussed this at committee and um, felt that we sh needed to address this and make sure that people were aware that it was out of order. There really wasn't a way to address the resolution being out of order by throwing it out of the book. 
And so that way, this way, the floor knew that it was out of order and um, it was also addressed as well so that the local wasn't left understanding why their re resolution wasn't addressed. Clear and transparent. It still seemed like it should have disappeared earlier. It still seemed like it should have disappeared earlier in the same way that uh, uh, many times um, when something that is viewed uh, as a uh, resolution for here is actually a bargaining issue, it doesn't make it into the book to start with. Right. They're, they're in the book yeah. and, and the, the convention floor makes a decision whether it goes to the bargaining table or not. The recommendation is what the committee makes, and but it is the ultimate decision of the convention floor. All right, so whether I, guess they're the, upholding. I guess the, I guess then the distinction would be that if it's out of order, then if it's out of order, it should not have been here to start with. That would be my opinion. Okay, thank you, brother. I'd be very concerned though about taking any resolution away from folks to be able, because otherwise then there could be the thought that perhaps we're trying to hide something, and that we never do. It's clear, transparent. It's in the book. The committee believes that it is out of order and it will be up to delegates whether they're going to take the recommendation from the committee. Seeing no other speakers to the mics, all those in favor of the committee's recommendation to reject, please press one. All those opposed, please press two. That is carried. Thank you very much. Back to committee. GR 17, the MGU will not offer new groups joining the MGU benefits that are more than what other locals and members are entitled to. The committee's recommendation is to refer to the board of directors noting that the Board of Directors to review for future consideration as there are many unknown variables when unions merge or as we succeed in intermingling votes. I so move. And second. Committee has moved and seconded. The committee's recommendation is to refer to the Board of Directors. Is there any further discussion on the direction of the referral? Seeing no speakers on the mics, if you're in favor, please vote one. If you're opposed, please press two of your electronic voting devices. I didn't say four. That is carried. Thank you very much. Back to committee. GR 18, the MGU will provide time off letters to employer and member at minimum three weeks prior to the date required, unless an emergency issue. Committee's recommendation is acceptance, noting already covered by policy 4.3.4.9. I so move. And second. It has been moved and seconded by committee. The committee's recommendation is to accept. It is in the policy, but this will just reinforce it. Any speakers to the mics? Seeing none, all those in favor of accepting the committee's recommendation to accept, please press one of your clicker and two if you're opposed. That is accepted, thank you very much. Back to committee. GR 19, the MGU will become an organizational sponsor of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, CCPA Manitoba office, and establish a financial support level. If the MGU is already an organizational supporter, that the MGU increase its financial support of, by 5% for fiscal years 2019, 20 and 21. The committee's recommendation is that to reject with a note that the MGU currently makes a monthly contribution to the CCPA. This amount was increased by approximately 50% in early 2016, and our current contribution provides us access to all the CCPA resources. Moved and seconded by committee. It has been moved and seconded by committee. Committee's recommendation is one to reject with note. Hey, Jody, we almost made it. <laughs> Brother on microphone three. Thanks, Jody Gillis. 
Red River College Local 73. I'm just curious, what is the monthly amount that we currently give the CCPA Manitoba? I thought that might come up. Do I have my second beep? Oh, okay. Well, I hope I took good notes then. <laughs> um, I have um, twelve fifty a month. It's fifteen thousand a year. Um, up eight hundred and thirty three a month. Um, up from eight hundred and thirty three a month. Okay. Good. Seeing no other speakers to the mics. All those in favor of the committee's recommendation to reject, please press one. Those opposed, please press two. That is carried. Thank you very much. Back to committee. <coughs> GR20, the MGU will develop a policy and guidelines to allow those areas, components, locals who wish to promote themselves on social media, website, YouTube channels, Facebook, Facebook page, for educational purposes, which include ed educational videos, public service announcements, meetings, training courses, and opportunities, etc. The option to do so. If possible guidelines, MGU retain the right to right to approve requests prior to area component local public posting of all content, area component local responsible to cover costs associated with the use of social media, area component local to have permission by ra to raise funds by requesting donations from members, selling promotional t-shirts, asking for donations from viewers, subscribers, area component local content will have necessary, necessary licensing and or permission to use videos, images, graphics, music, audio, to create new original content, videos, images, audio, and could conform to copyright laws and licensing usage. Area, component, local, and MGU will have the opportunity to work on joint projects having a common interest. The committee recommendation is to refer to the board of directors. Notice MGU will portion was edited to meet 150 word count maximum. The MGU already has some locals that have set up Facebook page and some guidelines currently exist. The incoming board of directors will review and determine if policy and guidelines need to be formalized. Uh, moved and seconded by committee. It has been moved and seconded by committee. The recommendation is to refer to the incoming board of directors. Any discussion on the direction of the referral? Brother on microphone one. Thank you, uh, Madam President, and congratulations on your re-election. Thank you, Rich. Uh, obviously, my name is Richard Murrell. I'm a member of uh, Golico Local 61. Uh, for you that don't know, uh, well, Golico, we're the liquor workers. Uh, we also represent the food and beverage workers at the casinos and the wonderful inspectors and folks at the L LGCA, which is now the Liquor, Gaming, and Cannabis Authority of Manitoba. Um, this resolution obviously comes out of my local, and uh, I'm the originator of it. And the reason for this is that things are very different today than they were back in the 1960s or the 1950s. Social media, everybody in this room has got access to social media, either using it or actually creating content. So, brother, I'm going to ask, you're going to be talking about the direction of where this is going? Yes, right. and uh, uh, the, the originally I thought that this would be a recommendation to reject. Uh, and I was prepared to go and speak upon that. Uh, yeah, it's on. But I agree with the, uh, with the uh, consensus of the uh, resolutions committee that this really needs to go to our board for discussion, debate, and policy development because there's nothing stopping any individual going and creating something, putting it on social media, and in inadvertently connecting it with our, our union. And the great thing about uh, social media, especially using video, you magnify attention to yourself and you multiply it, the good and the bad. And quite frankly, this union cannot afford to go and have in any way, shape, or form any content created by a member in either good intention or unfortunately rogue situations that negatively impacts this institution. So although I want to go and create my own 
or create for my local, because I'm into video production now, uh, a YouTube channel for our local for educational development of content, that's honorable. But I shouldn't be making political statements and connecting our union with it. So I ask that you support this because in the long haul, it's gonna allow all the locals, if you have the desire to create content, to create it seconds. and to do it well for everybody's benefit. Thank you. Thank you so very much, brother. No further speakers on con, so speaker on one, on microphone one, please. Hi there, and uh, my name is Corey. I'm from uh, Clerical Area 7, Local 7. Uh, congratulations as well for your position, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, just curious, um, uh, I think it's a good idea to, um, the, to refer this to the board of directors, um, but I wonder how I can also be on, have a, have a voice in with this, because uh, this is a huge issue. Um, the Facebook pages, YouTube channels, websites. Uh, I'd like to get in there and help out uh, and have a voice in there. Um, I don't know what the pr process for that, um, but I think this is, uh, especially in this day and age, it's very critical. Okay. So a couple of ways. Uh, one, you said it here now, so we're all aware. But the other one as well, you're going to have a component director that's elected and an area director elected. So when you're attending those meetings, if, you know, share with them where the concerns are and the fact that you would like to be involved in it, make sure they know that. And, you know, we, we are going to be welcoming anybody's input, any of our members. So that would be one way to, to make sure that everybody knows that you're interested in it. And the board will have to take a look on how we actually get this back to our membership and be able to figure out the guidelines on how we move it forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Corey. Sister on microphone one. Jen Brown, local 113, home care. As a young member representative, I think it's a good idea to have social media out there, even on your personal page, putting, hey, yeah, there's a meeting at this area at this time to get more people to attend. Because we have a younger generation and they're using social media, they're using all those resources that we never had many years ago to connect with people. So if we can get more people to meeting that way, all power to us. Thank you. Just a question. Did Andrew Wright ask you to come up? No. <laughs> I know our representative on the MFL young members. All right. So seeing no more speakers. Nope. All right. So it's been moved and seconded by committee. Committee's recommendation is to refer to the incoming board. All those in favor, please press 1. All those opposed, please press 2. That is carried, thank you. I see a sister on microphone three. No, nope, that's all right. Sorry, Kimberly Gray, local 113. I'm gonna be the pain in the bum today. Are you doing a point of privilege? Point yes, of I order? believe it's a point of privilege. Huh? I'm not 100% sure, so just bear with me. All the coffee and tea is gone, and it's barely even, I just got in here for one o'clock, because lunch was late and it was a really long, long line. Are we not getting any more? We will check on that because as a sister that loves her coffee, as you can tell by the amount of cups I've got up here, we'll check on that. Thank because you so much. I understand we're getting a cookie and I really want my coffee with my cookie. <laughs> <laughs> and the important work does begin. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Yep. Okay, then I will turn the chair over to Janet. We have election results for your third vice president. There were 347 ballots cast. There was one spoiled ballot. Shannon Reynolds, 156. Shelley Wiggins, 190. I declare Shelley Wiggins your third vice president. Congratulations, Shelley. Speaker, speaker, I'd like to, I'd like to acknowledge a speaker at mic four. I'd like to acknowledge a speaker at mic four. 
to give my uh, sincerest congratulations to Sister Wiggins. We'll see you back at home. And uh, thank you for all my supporters and votes. Appreciated. Thank you, Shannon. So we're just going to wait a sec. Shelly Wiggins, thank you. Um, thank you very much to my supporters. I guess when I walked down the ramp, I gave some people a chance to check out my boots as, Shannon, or as Amanda recommended. Thank you, Shannon, for uh, a good campaign. And thank you to all my supporters. And I look forward to working with you and hearing what you have to say about where we need to improve our membership education and how we can move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shelly. With that, see the General Resolutions Committee is already gone. They know their job. Um, I would like to invite the nominators and candidates for the position of fourth vice president to come forward, please. Oh, my apologies. Speaker at mic four. Hi, uh, Carol Reimer, University College of the North, local uh, 69. I just want to point a privilege here. Um, I've got the credentials report. The board and delegates, uh, 359, guests and honorary life members, 39, observers and media, 20. I so move. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Yep, Speaker at mic local, one. Legal uh, 26, board, I second that. Uh, all those, oh, sorry. Are you, are you coming to speak to the motion, sir? No. Okay. Uh, I I just want to say something. I don't like it to stay here and don't say nothing, just stay. But I am a man that I like it to talk, especially these wonderful people, a lot of people. And first of all, I want to say thank you so much for this, for this meeting around here. I'm sorry for my English. Um, my name is Ramon. I'm the president of Charon Home. And first of all, I so very, very, very happy that we elect Michelle Grawowski as our president. Okay. Woo! Thank you, sir. Are, are you? I'm so happy. And Charlotte and Chile. I'm so very happy that we elected those three women, sir. especially Michelle okay. Grawowski. Sir, i Okay. See you at the party. Okay, you guys, we're going to move on. We have a motion on the floor that has been moved and seconded. Thank you for your comments, sir. Um, the credentials report, I think we're at. Um, can we post the credentials report, please? And I'll ask all those in favor to press one, all those not, to press two. Pass. Thank you very much. Um, we'll just. Oh. Uh... Yes. You guys are first. And then Kim's folks. Um, uh, I think they can sit at that end. But Joe, Joe, and Chris. Okay, they're coming. How about right back there? Is that okay? Or should I pull another chair up? Just cozy up here now. 
Um, Deb, I'll invite you to speak first. And then Ed, when she's done, you can just take the mic. So good day, sisters and brothers. It gives me great pleasure to put forward the name of Ed Miller for fourth vice president. I've known Ed for uh, some time and uh, more time than I want to say. But when I first met Ed, I really thought that he was uh, a different kind of guy. He was rather large. He was rather loud. And uh, I always called him uh, a gentle giant, right? But I have come to learn that gentle giant is not the way to describe Ed. Gentle warrior is more like it. So Ed has been involved in pensions and benefits and the Grievance and Appeals Committee. He even is currently the Pension and Benefit Co-Chair. But what's interesting about Ed is that he's an educator and a mentor to people within his area. And so over the last couple of years, as someone new comes along and Ed's sitting on the Grievance and Appeals Committee, somebody says to him, I'm really interested in this. And what does Ed do? Steps down from the position to allow a new member a younger member to become involved and to become educated. That to me, sisters and brothers, is a solid, solid person. <laughs> Being the safety and health rep in his workplace and taking the time out for a sister who wanted to become more involved. So what did Ed do? Once again, mentored stepped down and allowed the sister to have the position. Ed has taken a good portion of his time learning about the different positions within the MGU, on committees, on the board, as a Labour Council delegate, and representing members across the board. But when I say that Ed is a gentle warrior, that's the gentle side of him. The warrior side is this. He believes in the labor movement. He believes in labor. He believes in the MGU. And he believes in you, the members. The time to talk and have conversations and take those issues forward to the board or to the MFL is what he does best. He's a gentle warrior. He will never give up on the labor movement, but more importantly, he will never get up, give up on you. Sadly, two Canadians who are alive this morning will have died in the workplace somewhere in Canada by the time I finish talking to you. That short amount of time. It's a statistic that still is hard to digest. And in this day and era, how these things continue to stay there is wrong. And I'm here to continue to fight for those members that can't fight for themselves, that won't fight for themselves. I'm a man of few words, but I have very large ears. I don't speak a great deal, sometimes not very articulate, but I feel in my heart that this is the right thing for me to do this year. I feel that the need definitely outweighs my, which is not great deal, but outweighs my ability, outweighs sorry, my fears of standing at this table in this chair to take ask for your vote. In October, two years ago, I was in this very same room 
with 300 other delegates. And of course, we had several very articulate speakers, and I had a chance to converse with one of them. And I asked her, how did she gauge success? Now, yesterday afternoon, one of our speakers already mentioned it, you may remember it, but she said, leave this world in a better place than when you found it. That's what I'm striving to do, for making this world a better place for everyone, not just a few members, but for everyone. Very simply, she said, you know, leave it a world in a better place. I mean, that's, that's simplistic but it's very powerful. And I believe everyone who is in the activist in the union wants that for everyone else. You wanna leave something behind for your kids, your family, your brothers, your sisters. One of my duties, if I'm elected the fourth vice president, is there to chair special events, special um, projects. And in the ever-changing world, the need to expand these duties and responsibilities must change as well. I would support the need for more membership involvement, which should include an ad hoc committee for members with disabilities. It should also include some sort of ad hoc committee to get young members involved with the labor family. And I, I choose this to make my personal goals to achieve those two tasks for this membership. I believe in empowerment to the members. I believe in strong, strongly in mentorship, as that's why I'm here today. And I wish to thank uh, my friend, my mentor, and my nominator, Deb Jamerson, for speech, speaking for me. I also wish to thank a lot of the members, lifetime members and staff that are in the back of the hall for their patience and support and give me what I needed to do and I thank them. I believe the requirements of the fourth vice president is to have skill, ability, expertise and above all experience. And I believe I have all those qualities. And I now ask you to consider me for the fourth vice president. And please, please have a safe trip tonight, have a fun night. And if I don't win today, win, lose, or draw, I'm still going to be here for you, the members. And not just my members. Again, every member that's here and every member that's out there with any labor union, with any province, any area. If you need something, come and see me. Thank you. Um, just before Barb comes up, and I'll let you know that once the speakers are all done, the coffee and tea are ready now. But, but again, I would encourage you guys to listen to the voice of your candidates. Good afternoon. I'm Barb Stambuski, Chief Steward of Local 360 in Area 3. It is both an honour and a privilege to be here today to nominate Penny Wainwright for fourth vice president. Penny has been a senior crop adjuster for Manitoba Agricultural Services Corporation for six years often putting in 50 to 60 hour weeks to make sure that our producers are taken care of in times of hardship. As with everything she does, it's a job that she approaches with drive and determination to help others. Her history and activism and leadership speak for itself. She has been the president of Local 362 for the past two terms and was recently elected to the position for another two years. She has sat on both the MGU and MFL's Women's Committee for the last two and a half years. She is co-chair of the MASC Safety and Health Committee and has sat at the bargaining table. She has only been with this union for six years. That's quite an accomplishment. She was also the Municipal Emergency Coordinator 
for the second largest geographical area in the province for five years, with five municipalities under her charge. To do this job requires exemplary leadership and organizational skills. What her history in activism doesn't show you is that her passion to help others in any way that she can extends to all other areas of her life. As a member of the community of Ericsdale, she is often called upon for help by other community members who feel they do not have a voice to face the challenges that meet them. As a friend, she is that person that will put her own needs last to help someone in their time of need. On top of all her personal and professional activism, she still finds time to be a wife, a mother, and a grandmother. If you elect Penny as your fourth vice president, you will be electing someone who will be available to all members, who will take time to understand your concerns and make sure that they do not go unheard. You will be electing someone who believes in transparency, honesty, and integrity, and who will never stop fighting for our members. You will be electing someone who approaches challenges with a level of strength and tenacity that is hard to match. But above all, you will be electing someone who truly devotes themselves to putting people first. Penny and I believe in the same thing, that a better union is possible. Everyone here today has the ability to make that happen. One vote. 1645, one vote gave Cromwell control of England. 1776, one vote gave America the English language rather than German. 1875, one vote changed France from a monarchy to a republic. And in 1923, one vote gave Hitler leadership of the Nazi party. So one vote can make a difference, and your vote will make a difference today. Your vote is your direct voice in the direction in which MGEU will go, so let's use that power of our ballot and make the right choice today to elect a new board to represent us for the next term. I'm incredibly honoured and grateful to have the chance to represent you as your candidate for fourth vice president. It's not always easy in a political setting to see the best in your opponents, but I have seen nothing but grace in my formidable opponents who care about the MGEU and are in this for the right reasons, all four. We, dif we differ in our methods, but I'm sure I can speak for everyone on this stage when I say all of us are here for the long haul. We're here for you. I might not be the best choice for fourth, but I'm a good choice. I'm enough. I'm full of compassion, I'm full of energy, and I genuinely want to make a difference. I practice kindness, and I'm not afraid of the truth. I'm a woman, and I am damn strong. I make mistakes, but I own them and I learn from them. And sometimes I'm terribly afraid I'll fail, just like now, running for a big position like this, being a lonely adjuster. But my faith is stronger than my fear. I have faith that you will believe in me too, and you'll elect me to support you as your fourth vice president of the MGEU. Thank you for your support. Merci, miigwech. you. <laughs> Good afternoon everyone. Um, I'm happy to be up here. It, it's a lot more nerve-wracking than it is down on the floor, but uh, I want to thank Will for, for not letting me know that I was going to be up here until a couple of days ago, otherwise I'd have been fretting about this for, for months now. Um, it is an interesting perspective up here. You know, you really get to, to look out over everyone and see what democracy looks like. And this is this is democracy at its finest. This is this is the decision making right here, guys. You know, in going into uh, when Will told me the other day that I was going to be up here, you know, kind of frantically trying to put together a speech, and uh, I'm listening to Wayne talk about corrections as being the older brother. And, uh, and I knew when he said that, you know, he had also made a comment about corrections or, or, or who's the drunk uncle. And I, I'd want to point out that as your brother grows up and you have kids, 
that you become kind of the drunk uncle and, and I die for a drink right now. <laughs> you, you know, I, I look out, we're brothers and sisters here, and, and with no offense to anybody here, you don't get to pick your brothers and sisters, but you do get to pick your friend. And, and I count Will as a friend of mine. And when he asked me to come up here to, to nominate him and to speak for him, it, it was an honor to sit there and do this because I do believe in Will. I do believe he is the man, the right man for this job. You know, Will and I had a chance to talk about, you know, what, what would he want me to say when he was up here? What, what would he want to convey to you guys? So I asked him, I don't know if many people know, but as fourth vice president, you get to, you get to choose the, the um, committee that you're going to co-chair, or chair, I'm sorry. And I asked, well, what, what committee would that be? And he told me that it would be health and safety. Without a doubt, it was health and safety. And um, Will, about 15 years ago, when he started in corrections, he, he developed, helped develop the program to, to bring together within corrections a, a health and committee program for, for all of us to follow within, within corrections. And I'm thankful that he did that. Um, looking at my time, running out of time now. Fifteen years ago, Will dedicated himself to lobbying the provincial government to, to, to create a memorial for, for fallen peace officers. And quickly thereafter, he realized that, that this needs to be expanded to firefighters and everyone, everyone who works. And, and last summer, they turned ground to, to create this memorial. Um, and it is that man right there that is going to create a permanent memorial. I feel like I need a big hook. I, I have my speech. I wrote it out like I was told. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Hi. My name is Will White. And I'd like to tell you a story. Like all good stories, mine begins at the dinner table. One night, I asked my kids how their day had went. My son, Kieran, he was excited. He had made a trade for a Pokemon card that day at school, and he was really pumped about this thing. My daughter, Anjali, equally excited because she had gone to the library, and that day she had picked out a My Little Pony book, and that's what we were going to read before bedtime that night. All in all, I thought things were pretty good. Things were going well. And then, then it happened. My son, he looks at me and goes, Dad, can I ask you a question? I'm thinking, comic book store, right? Instead, he looks at me and goes, Dad, am I less of a person because I'm not white like you? He was 10 when he asked me that. For those of you who don't know me, my family, my wife comes from India. And with this union that we have, we produce these two beautiful, intelligent, sometimes sassy kids. But they're not necessarily Caucasian in appearance. So I asked him, you know, where he was going with this. And he told me that at school that day, they're researching historical figures. So they were watching Donald Trump videos on YouTube. <laughs> so while I'm trying to explain to him kind of the nuances between American and Canadian politics, he goes, Dad, Dad, no, no. There was, there was ones in Canada here too. And he, he rattles off some names. And he says, he says Notley. He says Ford. He says, Pallister. Up to that point, I thought, I'm doing an okay job as a dad. And I'm doing an okay job as a union activist. You know, I've, I graduated labor college. I've been on these courses. I've taught these courses. I've been on these committees. I've chaired these committees. I've been to these rallies. I've been on these campaigns. I've done all these different things. But right there at my dinner table in 2018, I realized it didn't come to much right there. And so I made a choice. I knew that the world that my kids were going to go into was a lot different than the world that I grew up into. I knew that the world was now kind of enveloped in this cloud of darkness and that 
a change needed to happen, a change needed to occur. And if I was going to wait for that change to happen, it likely wouldn't. No. I knew then that I had to become this instrument of change. We have to become this instrument of change. Choice. So at that point, I decided that I needed to go on a journey. I needed to follow a path to a different world. And that journey begins here, today, with you. Now, one of the things I want to do is I want to try to heal the wounds that are within. Patch some of the cracks that we have in our union. Bridge some of the gaps. Reinvigorate re-energize, unionize, unite this great union. And once we've got it together and we're stronger and we're more powerful, then we take that to our communities. We take that to our towns. We take that to our cities. We take that to our province. We take that to our country. We become this wave of change and we make a difference. We go down this path. We choose this journey, not because it's an easy one, but because it is the hardest one that we can make. And we don't just do this for ourselves. We do this for our future. Regardless of how this election goes today, the union wins. There are phenomenal candidates here, and they all deserve your respect and your consideration. Regardless of how this vote goes today, I am going on this journey. And I'm inviting you to join me as we go on this trip, as we make this world a better place, as we make it what we want to see in this world. I thank you for your time. I thank you for your dedication. I thank you for your union activism. I thank you for exercising your democratic right to vote today. You are what makes this union special. You are what makes this union strong. Thank you. Merci. Megwitch. Namaste. Oh, and five seconds left. Thank you, candidates and your nominators. Um, I'm going to ask the balloting committee to come forward. Oh, oh my God. I am so sorry. My sincerest apologies. I'm so sorry. My apologies. Chris, would you please come forward to address the delegates on behalf of Joe? All right, I guess they saved the best for last, right? All right, thanks. Um, What can I say about Joe Dooley? He's a man of few words and less hair. I'm just, I'm just joking. You can't keep Joe quiet. Uh, Joe's been active with the union for 10 plus years. As a member, Joe has served as chief steward, vice president, president, and component director for his local. Many of you have known or have likely seen Joe at your local meetings and probably have wondered what he's doing there. Joe's attended these meetings because he wants to learn about different issues each local is having and bring it back here to inform everyone about them. Joe's been as far as Thompson, the Paw, and Dauphin for local meetings. He's a strong activist for health and safety and respectful workplace. Joe has been extremely active and dedicated in all his union roles and is not afraid to voice his opinion and concerns. He listens to the members and helps them to the absolute best of his ability. Joe is a straightforward kind of guy who calls a spade a spade. He's not afraid to ask the hard questions and get answers. I believe that Joe is the perfect candidate for fourth vice president, and if he is elected, he will do a fantastic job. And you, the members, will not be disappointed. So please vote for Joe Dooley. Thank you. I don't really need to say much more. I think my nominator covered everything. I'm sort of addicted on the health and safety because three years ago I was just about got killed on the job site. 
So now I want to try branch out so I can cover everybody that's here in the union, all the members. And with respectful workplace, I've been sort of rattled by management quite a bit, threatened to be fired and everything else. But with the union's help, we straighten them out. And it's fun doing that, believe it or not. I enjoy it. Because <laughs> they don't even know their own respectful workplace policy. And they're the ones that tell us this is what it is. You know, it's so much fun going in there. Don't you read your own books? And they get a little upset. They threaten to send you home. But that's fun. That's part of it. We have to try keep the government in line. It's a big title. I figure I can step up, fourth vice president, start pushing more buttons. Eh, I've got a no layoff clause till the end of March next year, so I might as well push as much as I can this year. <laughs> then a few of us, right, Grady, will be down the road. Speak for myself. Yeah, I will be, but maybe not you. I'm hoping not. <laughs> we, like, health and safety to me is a big thing because, like I said, what happened to me a few years back, it's so hard to implement all the different rules and regulations in every workplace. I'd like to get to know more about your workplaces. I've learned a lot being on the health and safety committees now. But it's interesting, every little branch of the government has their own little detail. I want to try understand it all and step on their toes when I can. And other than that, I'm going to save lots of time. Does anybody else want to buy some time? I'll give you some more. I'm not, hey, once we're done this, we're out of here. Thank you. Again, my apologies to the delegates, to Chris and to Joe. I do. How about I buy you lunch tomorrow? With that, I will now ask the balloting committee to come forward. If the sergeant at arms could please uh, call in the delegates if there's anybody in the hallway. And then once you've done that, if you would tile the doors. If you would take out your ballot books, and I'm just flipping, but there was one color that I thought was really pretty. How about number 10, the pink one? There's a delegate over there that was had it, and I thought, yeah, that does look pretty out there. Um, would the balloting committee please uh, open the boxes and show all our delegates that the boxes are, in fact, empty? Ooh, that's a nice picture. Um, I will remind you as delegates again, with multiple candidates, the successful candidate will have to have 50% plus one of the vote. Um, so we'll see how many times we have to vote today. And I would also just add, you guys will note that in your timetable, Kevin Rebeck's comments to you were an order of the day, but our elections are also an order of the day, so we're gonna pause on that order of the day until we've concluded this important business. And uh, with that, I would ask uh, the balloting committee to collect the ballots. The names are on the screen for your ease. Um, once uh, you folks have had a chance to cast your ballots, you can take your seats. The scrutineers, once you have had a chance to cast your ballots, you can meet Kevin at the back of the room. Again, please ensure you leave your cell phones behind.
Can I ask the delegates uh, to keep their seats and so we can find out if anybody hasn't had a chance to collect their ballot yet? Just to stay seated so if you have not had your ballot collected, if you could stand or wave your hand in the air. Are all the ballots collected now? Okay. Then I will ask the Sergeant at Arms to untile the doors. We'll send our balloting committee away. And um, I guess we'll bring the res General Resolutions Committee up. Sorry. So if the General Resolutions Committee can make their way to the front, we'll do a few more resolutions while our ballots are counted and once our elections are concluded, we'll invite Kevin to uh, address the delegation. All right, we're now going to continue with general resolutions. I believe we're starting on GR 22, and I will turn 21, stand corrected, turn it over to the committee. GR 21, the MGU will advocate for rent subsidy to be reinstated. Committee's recommendation to accept, moved and seconded by committee. The uh, committee has moved GR 21, moved and seconded. Uh, do we have any speakers on the microphone? Uh, see mic number four. Hi, Kelsey Montani, Local 393, Area 8. I rise in support of this because I am an x-ray technologist in Churchill. And last year, uh, thank you. Um, last year, my rent was 745 and suddenly it was increased to 1126 Now, I was on maternity leave during this time. I couldn't afford it, so I ended up having to go back to work early while my son was only eight months old instead of taking my 12 months. So please, please, I really hope that you accept the recommendation for this. Thank you. Thank you, sister. <laughs> Any other speakers on the resolution? Seeing no speakers, we will now vote. The committee's recommendation is that of acceptance. One, if you're in favor of the committee's recommendation. Two, if you are opposed. That is carried. Back to committee. GR 22, the MGU will update and create a more mobile friendly website, including more importantly, the source and forms within. Any recommendation to accept as amended? No. Nope. MGU website is mobile friendly. Issues with the source not being mobile friendly are currently being addressed with the software developer and the MGU staff. This work is expected to be conducted shortly. Conclude shortly, sorry. Uh, moved and seconded by committee. Uh, GR 22 has been moved and seconded by committee. Do we have any speakers on the resolution? Seeing no speakers at the mic. The 
Recommendation of the committee is that of acceptance as amended. If you're in favor, press one. If you are opposed, press two. You, that is carried. Back to the committee. GR 23. The MGU will send emails out to non-executive members about when and where area meetings are located so they can join in the discussion and meetings. The committee's recommendation is one to reject with a note that area council meeting notices are posted to the calendar on the MGU website which is accessible to all members. I so move. And second. Moved and seconded by committee. Any discussion on GR 23? And going to the mic. Oh. Recognize the member, uh, the delegate at Con 3. Uh, Jonathan Lipson, Government Community Workers. Thank you. Logo 256. Uh, I rise in rejection of the recommendation to reject. the. Although the information is posted on the MGU website on the calendar, uh, direct communication is a much better method to ensure attendance at these meetings and so I would appreciate that communication. Thank you brother. Going to a pro mic. Uh, mic number one. Ray Clausen, Local 26. Um, I'm not an exec a member of the executive but I do get mailed notices about area council meetings. I have no idea which box I checked to get that but it is available. Those notices are available by direct mail, so okay, thank, you. thank you, brother. Con Mike 3. Uh, yes, further to what uh, both my brothers said ahead of me, I do agree that email is probably more effective, and I do, too, get the mail version, uh, like the courier version, but it's just, to me, wasteful. An email would do just fine, and it also helps keep it fresh in your mind that you, oh, yeah, there's something coming up, as opposed to having to go and check for yourself. So if we're doing the send-out mail, I think we should be able to scrap that and do email, or have the option for both, just so that I don't upset those that still want the post. Thank you, sister. Speaker on mic one. Anarchy, local 20. Uh, with all respect to Larissa, I completely understand where she's coming from. Um, but I do understand that for Area 7 alone, that would be 8,000 email, and it would take our equipment an entire day to email that many emails out. It would be an entire day of, uh, of computer use time to, uh, to get that done uh, just for the email alone, just for that one area. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, sister. Any other speakers? Speaker on microphone one. Hi, Carol Reimer, Local 69. Um, as much as I can appreciate the mail thing in the email, and I'm personally a fan of email, um, it doesn't take an entire day. A distribution list can be created. It's a matter of seconds to choose it and send it out. Thank you, sister. Pro mic number one. Hi, I'm first time speaker. And my name is Cheryl Fraser and I'm a clerical area four, local four. Um, I just, uh, I think I agree with the, the committee's recommendation because does not all places have an actual MGU board where we can put our information about our meetings? No? Okay. I'm just new, so um, because I have one in my workplace, and I have 40 staff in my workplace, so I post my meetings there. Thank you, sister. Con mic number three. Hi, Vicki Rampo. I'm with uh, Local 113, and uh, I think that I'm against this uh, movement to reject this because any means possible should be used to get members out to all the meetings. Thank, Thank you, you, sister. Any other speakers on the resolution? Seeing none, 
If you are in favor of the committee's recommendation of rejection, please vote one. If you're opposed to the committee's recommendation, please vote two. That is carried. Back to committee. GR 24. The MGU will go forward with using more electronic means of communication instead of paper copies. The committee's recommendation is to accept as amended. The MGU has an existing protocol whereby if the MGU has an active personal email, communications will be sent electronically with some limited exceptions. I so move. And second. Moved and seconded by committee. Do we have, oh, uh, see a speaker on pro mic number one. Glenn Van Loon, Local 133, Manitoba Museum. I speak strongly in favor of this. It's a move in the right direction. It could even dovetail into helping us with the last one at some point uh, to get more electronic communications. It's broad enough to be flexible. But you know what? This is kind of an ecological thing. It's part of saving trees. We only have four resolutions in the entire book that have anything to do with ecology at this time of difficult times that involve plastic straws, we won't get to, uh, inv involve uh, our carbon tax, and involve saving paper on, on printing and saving paper on communications. And I just think we can do better. Every little step we can make a major step. And I would offer a challenge to, uh, I'm chair of our sustainability committee, and this is one of the things we've really been working on for the last six years. But uh, in two years from now, I would really like to see us take uh, ecological motions a, li a little bit more seriously and see whether or not they make it to the floor. I think we need to pay attention, uh, attention to some really severe ecological issues as, as, as union members and pass them on to our brothers and sisters. The, the last thing I would say is that I did a count just after on the issue of little ecological steps that make a difference. And after lunch, I found 34 reusable coffee mugs on people's chairs, which is great, and all kinds of people with water bottles. Hey, this is a little thing, but it's not a little thing. It's uh, you take all those little steps and they add up. So uh, I, sp I speak strongly in favor and, and hope that we do better at the next convention at from our locals at addressing ecological issues. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Seeing no other speakers out. Oh, no, just a vote. Uh, I, con mic number three, sister. Shirley Russell, uh, Area 5, Local 405. Thank, Thank you. you. Shirley Russell. Um, I have a concern because I live in an area where our cell service is almost nil at times, and I have an issue. I get my emails and stuff but I have no way of printing them, and it's frustrating because of my service. That's my issue with this. I agree, electronic works, if you can print your stuff out. Thank you, sister. Any other speakers on the resolution? Okay. Brother on mic three. Indeed, you prove uh, Dauphin uh, Trades Area 2, Local 50. I never said that such a small thing going to move me to come to this mic. Um, you can tell I'm young enough, and I do use email. But you can call me old school. I love to stick that thing in my fridge that reminds me that I have to go there. I love to read books the paper copies instead of reading them on something else. And we probably have to remember that technology is great, but we illuminate jobs also, not just trees. And we have a great recycling program. You know, we're not putting that into a landfill. We recycle that paper. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Uh, committee has a point of information on this uh, resolution. For those people who are concerned that this resolution would mean that all communications would go by email, we do have a policy in place that allows 
the delegates or it allows our members to choose which method that they're communicated with. So just so accepting our committee recommendation would allow those members who wish to receive their communication by email and the cases that it's able to do so to be able to do that. Those who still need to have that paper copy mailed to them because of access to internet services or what other issues with that would still be have the option to receive a paper copy mailed to them. Okay. Seeing no other speakers, we will now place it to a vote. And the committee's recommendation is that of acceptance. One if you're in favor and two if you're opposed. Thank you. Back to committee. Okay, GR 25, <laughs> the MGU will provide meeting notices in either an electronic or hard copy format at the choice of the member. Committee's recommendation is to refer to the Board of Directors. The Board of Directors is to assess the feasibility and costs associated with and consider issues of confidentiality, notice and legal obligations. I so move. And second. Moved and seconded by committee. Do we have any speakers on the resolution? On the referral only. Seeing none, we'll now vote. One, if you're in favor of the committee's recommendation to refer to the Board of Directors. Two, if you're opposed on the referral to the Board of Directors. That is carried. Thank you. Back to committee. Uh, GR 26, the MGU will have the MGEU IT department explore adding time off letters and correspondence to the source. And the committee recommendation is to accept as amended. And uh, I so move. Sorry. Moved and seconded by committee. GR 26, the recommendation by the committee is accept as amended. Do we have any speakers? Seeing no speakers, if you're in favor of the committee's recommendation of acceptance as amended, one if you're in favor, two if you're opposed. Thank you, that is carried. Back to committee. Uh, GR 27, the MGU will seek to have some kind of interpreter services which is shown on our website for members who use English as a second language and the service must be recognized, must be a recognized union or be part of the MGU membership. The committee's recommendation is referred to the Board of director, Directors. I so move. And second. Moved and seconded by committee and the recommendation is to refer to the Board. So do we have any discussion on the referral to the Board? or the direction. I uh, recognize the sister at microphone one. Um, Carol Grant, um, local 421, area three. Uh, so as a member of the Equality and Human Rights Committee, um, we had a big discussion about this. Um, when we did look into finding out who the interpreter services were for the MGU, we realized that they are not unionized. So that is why we have added that um, in there so that they are a recognized unionized interpreter service. Thank you, sister. We are. Okay. It's on the referral. Okay, thank you. Now, your comments will be on whether or not to refer it to the board or to another body, not on the main motion. I am actually so much for this. Oh, by the way, it's D. Michael, um, 113 Home Care. I'm very much for this, but I want 
one thought to be there when it goes back to the board is that sometimes workers don't like their own workers to know what's going on. So if we have interpreters, it should be maybe something that could cross over. Roll mic number four. We are talking just on the referral, not on the main motion. Uh, my name is Netra Kafle, uh, local 382, area 6. I just wanted to clarify about the uh, questions the sister was raising. Uh, actually, um, I'm from the uh, WRSA interpreters, and I believe we are unionized. That's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other speakers at the mic, we will now vote on the referral to the board. The committee's recommendation is to refer to the board. If you're in favor of the referral, one. If you're not uh, in favor of the referral, press two. Thank you, that is carried. Back to committee. GR 28, the MGU will participate in the Manitoba Federation of Labor Young Worker Assembly, which is to be held biannually. MGU participants will include the Young Members Committee, additional participants as elected by area councils. And the committee recommendation is to accept. And I so move. And second. Moved and seconded by committee. Pro mic number one. Hi, uh, Andrew Wrights, Local 26, um, and I'm also the MFL um, Young Worker Rep. I just want to speak in favor of the motion. Uh, it comes from MGU's Young Member Committee. Um, the MFL held their first annual Young Member Assembly uh, earlier this year, um, and the workshops and the knowledge that were passed on to the participants was phenomenal. Um, it's a great value for our members. Uh, we're looking to expand and obviously uh, be able to train our base as well. Um, at the MFL level, they were... Uh, uh, some of the topics that we discussed include precarious work in the gig economy, uh, young, mem young member engagement and mobilization, bargaining issues for younger members, uh, unsafe work, human rights, political action, all of those uh, core well-rounded kind of issues that you'd expect our, uh, our members to have. Uh, this is a great value for us and uh, again I support this. Thank you. Thank you so much brother. Brother on microphone one. Troke, second vice president. Uh, this uh, resolution is very similar to FC14. It has uh, financial implications to the union. I am fully in support of the idea, but I think we just need to refer it to the board, uh, have some costing and participation uh, information done so that we are being uh, diligent with the union's funds. Thank you. You're mo making a motion for a referral? Yes, I am. Do we have a seconder for that? Microphone three, please. Uh, Kimberly Lynn, post-secondary component director, I second the motion. Thank you so much. It has been moved and second to refer to the Finance Committee for costing. Uh, referrals and hmm? To the board. Okay, sorry, I stand corrected. It has been moved and seconded to refer to the board for further study on. Uh, all those, seeing no other speakers to mics, all those in favor of the referral, please press 1. Those opposed, please press 2. That is carried. Thank you. Turn it over, turn it over to Director Kaler. Thanks very much. I have the results from our ballot uh, for your fourth. Sorry, speaker at mic two. <laughs> uh, Kevin Rebeck, balloting chair from MFL. So I just wanted a chance to come to de the delegates and raise an issue that came up with the last election. Uh, we do our best job to make everything run smoothly, but sometimes hiccups happen. And when we went to uh, right before the last election to collect the ballots, there was one additional ballot stuck in a box. It was from the last election. So I met with the scrutineers from the last election and went over it with the balloting committee. 
I raised the issue with the chair of elections and said, look, uh, you know, let's acknowledge that that happened. Uh, it certainly wasn't deliberate. It was an error. It does not change the final results, but it should change the recorded record on how many votes were cast. So there was one additional ballot for Shannon. So it would be 348 ballots that were cast, 157 for Shannon, 190. That does not change the election results, but we wanted to be completely transparent and clear with you that error, error did occur. We're doing our best to, not to make it happen again. And uh, I thought it important to bring that to your attention before we moved on to the next election. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, the results for uh, fourth vice president, Penny Wayne White, 51, William White, 73, Joe Dooley, 106, Ed Miller, 113. So we will vote again. Um, and this time there will be three candidates. And if you could post those for me, please. Those will be Joe Dooley, Ed Miller, and William White. My apologies. There were 344 ballots cast with one spoiled ballot. I had, to I had to pick it up, sorry. Okay, so can I first ask uh, the Sergeant at Arms to invite our delegates in, make sure everybody's here, tie all the doors. Getting there. You guys are all way ahead of me. Okay. Oh, the okay, but the balloting yeah. committee, I guess, has to come in first before we tell the doors. Yeah, that, that, was, that, was, that was the first. It is a long game. I, I think I'm doing everything possible to make sure they don't ask me to do this again next time, by the way, but not on purpose, just you know, so we know. We always say you learn by the time. That's right. Okay, so assuming the balloting committee has since made its way into the Convention Hall. I will now ask the Sergeant at Arms to tell the doors. I, oh my gosh. Our balloting committee is still locked in the room. Really? <laughs> Holy crap. I am so sorry, you guys. I'm like, okay, so don't tell the doors. I'm like, where are they? Like, what are these people doing? Let them out. Okay, I've, I've let them out of the room. <laughs> it's, you know, you guys, it's a little bit of a walk. So do we want to do one more resolution while we're waiting, or do you want to just wait? How about if we plow through one more resolution? No, that's the wrong word. How about if we carefully consider one more resolution while they come back? Glad Janet's not my boss. I'm glad you guys are. <laughs> so GR 29, page 90, and I turn it back to the committee. Okay, GR 29, the MGU will publish the provincial officer's financial compensation online. The committee's recommendation of that is that to reject, with a note that the provincial <laughs> officers will receive an honorarium as determined by convention uh, for 2.4.2 of the MGU Policy and Procedure Manuals and 26.5 of the MGU Constitution and Bylaws, financial statement is provided to all delegates at convention. And moved and seconded by committee. Okay, it's been moved and seconded by committee. Committee's recommendation is to reject with explanation. Seeing no speakers to the mics. Oh, for heaven's sakes, Doug, you knew it was coming. <laughs> Troke, second vice president. I'm just getting used to this coming to the microphone and talking thing, you know, so first time speaker, no, it's okay. <laughs> Good try, brother. In case right. anybody wants microphone to, one. Anybody wants to know, it is actually disclosed on your financial statement on the last page. It's on a separate line item called vice president's honoraria, and I don't have to explain that you only have to divide it by four. Divide it by four. Thank, Thank you, you very much, brother. Seeing no other speakers to the mics, all those in favor, press 1. Those opposed, press 2, please.
That is carried. Thank you. Back to committee. Maybe one more. I don't see anybody. Oh, hold off. They are now coming in. And to the poor balloting committee. <laughs> So let's try this again. Um, with the sergeant at arms, please make sure our delegates are all in the hall and then tile the doors. And with the balloting committee, please reflect to our delegates that the boxes are in fact empty. And for our delegates, I'm going to choose number 15, this lovely blue. Please put one of three names on your ballot. Once the scrutineers have had a chance to cast their ballot, please join Kevin at the back of the room. I'm sorry. It's not showing up because the color's bad. Have we collected any ballots yet? I'm looking to the balloting committee. Have any ballots been collected yet? Okay. Okay. So do not use this. Okay. The like Keener's got two. Um, Kevin. We inadvertently collected two ballots, so could we open this ballot box to have them taken out? Or could we just throw new ones in? Well, we're not going to use the blue, so, so the contrast isn't showing up. So could we just, I want to change it if, change colors. So we don't, can we just leave those two in there and they'll just be spoiled ballots? Is that all right with everybody? Okay, they won't be spoiled ballots. We just, they won't be counted. Okay, so we will not count these two. Everybody gets rid of these. Okay, there's four that we, four of them. We will not count them. Okay. Yes, take them. Okay. Un momento, por favor. You know, it's funny how everybody's vying for a color. It's all like the price is right, where cards are being raised. And but, but this, the light blue, number 14, is nice and light. It should show up really well. Oh, groans. So, so it's a baby blue. It's, um, that's what we're using now. I've, I've committed myself. Number 14 is your ballot. Please indicate one name on there, and I'll ask the balloting committee to start collecting. Mike's already done his role. <laughs> Again, uh, for the scrutineers, once you have put your ballot in the box, please make your way to the back of the room. All of you had your ballots collected? Have you guys had your ballots collected? While they're collecting the ballots, can I just take a moment to acknowledge, I have worked for the MGU for 12 years. I was a, I worked for the MGU for 12 years. I was a member for 16 before. So in those 28 years, I don't recall, although I could be wrong, 
Having uh, gotten through all the committee resolutions and this far through the general resolutions, and I want to congratulate you as delegates and as well the Convention Planning Committee for restructuring convention in a way to really allow you guys to make those important decisions. It's really a talk. You know, I would say in response to the delegate that earlier mentioned the extra four or six inches worth of room in the rows, as I see the balloting committee shuffling through, yeah. I suspect they would appreciate the extra room as well. We appreciate you, Teresa. <laughs> well, <laughs> then it becomes a challenge. Are there any delegates that have not had their ballot picked up yet? I don't see anybody waving their hands or anything. I would ask the Sergeant of Arms to open up the doors and we'll excuse our balloting committee and the scrutineers to go and do their work. And then I will turn the chair back to Michelle. Okay. Just a little taller than that. No, all right. That's all right. <laughs> GR 30, page 91, and back to committee, please. GR 30, the MGU will direct the Pension and Benefits Committee through members on superannuation and insurance liaison committee, the SILC, or Manitoba Federation Labor, MFL, to in continue to encourage defined benefit pension plans for members. And the committee's recommendation is that to accept, moved and seconded by committee. It has been moved and seconded by committee. Committee's recommendation to accept. I have a brother on mic one. Jonathan, I'm so glad you joined us this year. <laughs> I'm having fun. Jonathan Lipson, awesome. uh, Government Community Workers, Local 256. As it turns out, this is actually an area of expertise for me. Um, the MGEU is one of the only remaining unions and the only remaining group plans to have a defined uh, benefit plan. And industry professionals have proven and agree that this is a better benefit plan than the uh, more common defined contribution plan. Yep. So I want to congratulate the MGEU and encourage everyone to support this. Thank you very much, Jonathan, and you're absolutely correct. And I see a brother heading to Mike One. Oh, thanks, Michelle. Jody Gillis, Local 73, also chair of the Superannuation and Insurance Liaison Committee, and I welcome this uh, resolution. I think it's very important to have the communication between our committees. Uh, this is a, a more important than ever subject. I think we all have to be active in terms of our pension plans that we are fortunate to be a part of. When you see a news article in the paper about pensions, write to the editor, get that in the paper, get our thoughts in the paper. Um, there's been a coordinated attack on workers and pension plans across this country and we have to stand up and fight for what's right. We have to fight for these plans. People like to paint these plans in a way that it sounds like these are fat cat pensions that are being promoted, being paid for by employers, but we know that it's our pension contributions too that come off every one of our paychecks. Those are pensions that we pay for. So um, this is a really important uh, subject to me. Uh, it's my passion and i um, happy to support it. Thank you very, very much for the information, brother. And you're absolutely correct. Thank you so much. Seeing no other members at the mics, all those in favor of the committee's recommendation to accept, please press one. Any opposed, please press two. Yeah. 
It is carried. Thank you and back to committee. All right, we'll be skipping GR 31 because it's covered by 145. So we're going to GR 32. The MGU will prepare and make available upon request a package of information and resources for injured or disabled members. The committee's recommendation is that to reject with the note that the MGU is committed to ensuring that we are accessible and our services are available to all members. We will endeavor to assist members who are injured or disabled. There is not one standard package of information that would fit the varied members' needs. Moved and seconded by committee. Okay, so it's... Can I do a point of order? Where are you? Oh, there's Larry. Larry. Yeah, can I do a point of order, please? Um, since the other uh, resolution covered uh, one way down the road, 143, can we combine them together since they're the same anyways? 145, sorry. It, it, it does. Actually, yeah. it'll so cover So why both. don't we do it next? We're, we're doing, yeah, which one are we doing? But we're not going to get to 145, so why don't we, it's already been mentioned. For, uh, I'm going to, he wants to know why we're not doing 31, but we're waiting for 145 on that. Is it the wording? We're not going to get to 145. There'd be reasonings why the committee would have put them as a composite, and then they choose which one would actually benefit members the most is what I'm assuming I'm looking There's a direction. possibility I wrote both. <laughs> um, we had no choice in the order that the resolutions were numbered in. Uh, the system actually does that, and GR 145 actually has the better language to meet what you're looking for with getting a uh, lobbying to develop an, a committee. Um, we are our policy is to go with the resolutions in order that they are in the book. Previously, uh, one other order, you did a whole bunch together. You did not wait till the end. You read it. It was the first one come, and you went. No, you did. With, with the resolution that you're referring with to. That, you know what? Sorry. Sorry, sister. I'm going to rule you out of order, Larry. Okay. I think the committee has actually given a very good explanation. And the, knowing when I look at 145, I see that it does say that to accept it. And the recommendation, if whatever doesn't get done, goes back to the board. So your, the resolution will not be lost. Okay. So I would just like to continue on. Okay? Knowing that it will be recognized. Okay. Shut up and sit down. Okay, Larry, we're not married. I couldn't tell you that, but thank you so much. <laughs> All right, back to committee GR32. The committee has moved and seconded, and the committee's recommendation is to reject. All those, seeing no other speakers, maybe. Okay. Sister on microphone two. Hi, Jenna, MGU421. Uh, um, maybe I just want to make either a friendly amendment or a referral to the board. I've dealt with people with new disabilities due to their work, and lots of them have so many questions about what's my first step. And even if we just make sort of a generalized PowerPoint available to our members, I think it would help them in the long run. Duly noted, sister, thank you. Um. Yeah. Speaker on microphone three. Joe Breno. Oh, sorry. It's all right, Joe. Physical, physical sciences, uh, local, area seven, local 40, uh, call the question. Question's been called. We have a seconder for calling the question. Sister on microphone three. Paulus, Brandon University, I second that motion. Thank you much. The question has been called, moved and seconded. All those in favor of calling the question, one now on your device, please, and two if you're opposed to calling the question. Thank you. The question has been called. Going back to the original resolution, 
Committee's recommendation once again is to reject. All those in favor of the committee's recommendation, please press one. All those opposed, please press two. That is carried. Thank you. Back to committee. GR 33. The MGU will address the issue of union center not being properly accessible at key areas for people with disabilities when entering all doorways, rooms, and washrooms through the union center board. Committee recommendation is accepted as amended. Moved and seconded by committee. Moved and seconded by committee to accept as amended. Seeing no speakers at the mics, all those in favor of the committee's recommendation to accept, please press one. Those opposed, please press two of your devices. That is carried, thank you very much. Back to committee. GR 34, the MGU will use gender neutral language in all documents, forms, policies, written and written materials, etc. In addition, the MGU will use gender neutral language in speaking about or to members. This includes but not limited to convention. Recommendation is uh, referred to the Board of Directors. Note, the Board of Directors to consider appropriate gender inclusive neutral terminology in our communications. Moved and seconded by committee. Thank you very much. It's been moved and seconded by committee, referring to the Board of Directors. Any discussion on where the resolution is being referred to? Brother on microphone three. Hello, everybody. Richard Hines, AFM Area 6. And I speak against it being referred to the Board of Directors because we're all here in the room, all the delegates, and I would like us to be able to have a say in what happens with this. Because I've seen this happen at MFL where um, it's referred back to them and we don't hear about where that's gone and it's it's an important issue and I think we should have a say. So, if we're looking for a little bit of clarification. Yes. Parliamentarians looking for so you're you want the floor to actually deal with the resolution, not have it referred to the board Correct. of directors. So you're referring it back to convention floor? Yes. Okay, so the way to do that is to defeat the referral to the Board of Directors, which okay. then brings it back to the floor. Okay. So I'm going to move to have the floor. Sorry. You, you, no, it's okay, brother. What we'll do is okay. we'll put it to a vote, and depending on how the delegates choose, then, you know. So again, the recommendation is to refer to the incoming board with direction. All those in favor of the referral from the committee, please press one on your devices now. Two if you're opposed. I love democracy. Congratulations, brother. All right, so it has been rejected with permission of the convention floor. I am going to refer this back to committee to bring it back to us. So in between the announcement right after Kevin Rebeck, I would ask you to please reconsider and then bring it back to the convention floor. The committee is going to, they need to do a recommendation because we don't vote on the resolutions themselves, we vote on the committee's recommendation. So I'm instructing back to the committee. They will come back with a recommendation and we'll bring it back to the floor to see where it goes. All right, thank you very much. So we will hold off on GR 34 and it will return back to the convention floor. GR 35. GR 35. The MGU will provide local 262 Society for Manitobans with Disabilities, SMD, 
and any other local with deaf and or hard of hearing individuals to use American Sign Language for daily communication. The staff re representative who agrees to undergo specialized training in American Sign Language and deaf culture. Committee's recommendations to reject. Note, ASL interpretation is, is a highly specialized skill for which the MGU purchases services from qualified individuals. Staff representative assignments for various reasons require change. Uh, moved and seconded by committee. Okay, it's been moved and seconded by committee. The committee's recommendation is one to reject with a note of why they've rejected. Seeing no speakers going to the mics, all those in favor of the committee's recommendation, please press one. All those opposed, please press two. That is carried. Thank you. Back to committee. GR 36. The MGU will be more diligent when considering venues for MGU events are accommodating and accessible for members with mobility issues. The committee's recommendation is to accept and I so move. And second. It's been moved and seconded to committee. Committee's recommendation is one to accept. Seeing no speakers at the mic, all those in favor of accepting the committee's recommendation, press one. Those opposed, please, please press two. <laughs> that is carried. Thank you. Back to committee. GR 37. The MTU will develop and roll out a new safety and health campaign to focus on mental health. The committee's recommendation is to refer to the board of directors. The board of directors is to review for future campaigning consideration and priorities. This, I so move. And second. It has been moved and seconded by committee. Recommendation referred to the board of directors with instruction for the review as they always do. So, okay. Speaker on microphone three. Well, I'm Mike Bartell, uh, Corrections, Area 7. I would just like to uh, speak against this and ask that we be given the opportunity to vote on it here. It's a referral, so all you can speak to, brother, is where it's going to be referred to. You're asking it to come back to the floor. Right, so I'm asking that it come back to the floor. That'll be another one then that I'm going to have to be directing to the committee. If it's defeated, yeah. Seeing no other speakers, all those in favor of referring to the Board of Directors? I wouldn't dare not let you speak, brother. Thanks. Microphone uh, three. Rob Burnett, I'm speaking against it from Area 7, Local 14, Corrections. This is a growing issue, not only unique. Brother, uh, are you speaking to the referral to where it's being referred yes, to? Yes, I am. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Actually, I'll just get right to it then. My question is with the referral to the board, much like every other referral that seems to get stonewalled and pushed to them, what sort of involvement do the members have then at that point? Because that's, that's kind of the frustration we're feeling. You know, like we, we keep push, putting these issues, we write them and we give them to you guys because they're, uh, they're issues that are serious to us, uh, whether it just be unique to a small subsection or every one of us. It, it affects all of us. And So any referral to the Board of Directors, you're going to have a representative too. You're going to have one from your component. You'll have one from your area. So when, you know, say something like this, the Board of Directors always takes a look at, um, and now with the Risk and Strategy Committee that we have actually developed in the last little over a year ago now, we actually take a look at where is the biggest risk and where is the biggest challenge for our membership. And that is when the board decides which campaign is going to be moving forward. It doesn't mean we don't do all of them eventually. We look at where the real hot spots are. So what you have is the two members that are sitting on the board of directors that represent you. 
As well, you also have the ability to phone in and ask at any pin given time where the resolution is sitting and where things are once they've referred to, into the board of directors. So when we call and we inquire about that, can we give feedback that can be forwarded to the board then? Because, I mean, there's a lot of people sitting here that have a lot to speak to this one, uh, to the first one that was pushed back and asked to come back to the floor. And we all have input on it. And it right. seems like no one really wants to listen to it. And it feels like the same sort of environment in my workplace is happening right here. Yeah. I understand that, brother. understand it totally. One of the other communications that we have now built within the MGEU is the ability for any member to either send the letter in, to be able to send an email to the resource center, address it to the president, and those, that always, those always get addressed and they go to the areas that they need to go into if there's questions to be asked. The answers are definitely sent out. So we, we have the open line of communication is there and the ability to contact your union at any time it's now. It's there, but just not here. We're, when we're all here right now, we can listen to each other and have each other's back in solidarity. But brother, with some of these, you don't have all of the information that actually needs to be considered. And if we were to bring the finance committee to take a look at what the cost of this would be, or the, you know, the, the risk and strategy committee to take a look at every campaign and where things are going to go, we would be here for about four and a half months actually trying to get through everything. So you elect your board of directors, your representatives to actually go there, taking your best interest to heart. And that is what we rely on. And, and trust me, brother, there's no yes man on that board of directors. Everybody has a say and they have the ability to oh, yeah. be able to share. I hear what you're saying and yeah. I just want to clear, I strongly suggest everyone vote against the referral and that we put this back. Of course, it's always up to the delegates to be able to know how they're going to do this. It's the delegates' choice on how we do this, and I won't dictate one way or the other on how we do this. If that's what the will of the floor, then that's what we do. I don't believe we have a deadline of when we have to leave the convention center. Okay, that's good to know. All right. <laughs> we have a brother on microphone one. Troke, uh, second vice president. As Michelle said before, the, uh, the Risk and Strategy Committee reviews these types of items. These are not, you know, $10,000 items. These, these campaigns cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, everyone here doesn't have the information available to say, okay, I want to do this one over another one because we could have 17 resolutions that say, I want to have a, a, a campaign for this, for that, and for a lot of things, we just don't have enough money to, to spend on all of that. Plus, we need to prioritize them. Uh, I, every group is well represented on that risk and strategy committee. So it's not like it's all a group. Of, it's not just one group of, of people. It's, it's, a, it's a broad uh, base of all of our members. So I stand in uh, favor of recommending it to the board so that it can be studied further. And uh, we don't uh, make a decision here that we don't have all the information for. Thank you. Thank you, brother. How are you? <laughs> brother good. on microphone two. I'm good. I really wish that would slim me more. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> uh, Jake Rempel, main component, uh, local 33. I'm really concerned that we have, and I'm, I'm concerned that it's going to the board simply because I would hope that we're further ahead than the provincial government, and obviously we're not if we're talking about mental health uh, campaigning, because even the government themselves provide mental health first aid training for frontline workers, particularly I know at EINA, because we did that for the reason because they've got mental health clients coming in so you can address some of those issues. So my concern is, why have we not done this a long time ago? That's very concerning. Well, brother, I will say that we advocate on behalf of mental health issues in the province always. It is the government's job to be looking after mental health, not ours. We're there to make sure that our members are protected, that provide the coverage that is needed. And again, the board hasn't said no to doing something like this. Is there a way we could work a mental health campaign into something else? What would be the true cost of it? What part of mental health would we be covering off if this does get passed by this convention floor? We have representatives of about 353 that represent 40,000. Do we, each of us, know in this room for sure 
of what those members out there want us to be covering on mental health. So when we're looking at the referral to the Board of Directors and the committee's recommending that, I'm fully, fully confident that they're looking at it in a way that we go back to the membership, we talk to those folks that get elected on your Board of Directors that you're going to elect to make sure that they understand what your needs are. And again, opening the lines of communication to be able to have emails sent in, letters sent in. I've got an open door. If folks have a request or have a concern, they're more than welcome to set up a meeting and I will come to you or you can come to me, whichever works. But I understand what you're saying. I think it would be really, really hard and almost irresponsible for us to set something in stone here when we don't have all the facts as Brother Troke has just said. Um, if you want a second time, speak on it. I wasn't Okay, I'm going to go over to uh, that was a con microphone number one, please. Uh, hello, Larissa, Red River College, uh, local 73. I just wanted to um, support this going back to the board for further consideration, so that we don't have a knee-jerk reaction that is going to tie our hands financially. Um, <clears throat> I work in mental health. I'm a big supporter of mental health and all of the information and a vote to support the recommendation doesn't necessarily mean that it's a vote against mental health. It's a vote to further investigate the financial consequences of that and to balance it out. It is not against mental health. Thank you, sister. I'm going over to microphone number two. Too. I'm not sure who yeah, was, I was here first. first yeah. All yeah. right, Larry. Okay. Okay. I'm going to make it very quick, Larry Bailey, uh, Local 47, Area 7. Um, people with disabilities for years and years and years, I'm like a broken record, feel very unheard. And we're very scared when things get referred off. So please, um, I'm at a con, Mike, because it's it appears to people with disabilities, and we've heard it very loud and clearly at this uh, conference, it's an issue. We need to deal with it. And I guess I'm going to make, an, if I can make a friendly amendment, that we um, uh, have it dealt with in, within 90 days. Am I at the wrong mic? Are nope, you going to nope, rule me I'm out of order? <laughs> That way we've been heard, if we have a 90 day thing and then there's a guarantee we're being heard. So the parliamentarian is pointing out to me that you'd already spoken on it so you actually can't make a motion, an amendment to it. Um, and again, you know, I, I will commit that the Board of Directors is going to be taking a look at where things are, where we're sitting, this, the Safety and Risk uh, risk and Strategy Committee will be looking as well. So, but we hear you, and I think anybody in the room has heard you. If someone else chooses to go up to make an amendment, that's their right to do so. Uh, I'm going over to a pro mic. Uh, sorry, I go con mic, con, con pro. Brian Wilson, Physical Sciences, Local 38. I would like to call the question. Yeah. Woohoo! The question has been called. Do we have a seconder for that? Do we have a seconder? Hello? Oh, okay. Sorry, Jody. Thanks. Uh, microphone four. Jody Gillis, Local 73. I second the call. The question. Thank you so much. All those in favor of calling the question, please press one. If you're opposed, please press two. The question has been called. Thank you very much. So all those in favor of the committee's recommendation to refer to the incoming board of directors, Please press 1. All those opposed, please press 2. Sorry, brother. I'd like to challenge the chair. Absolutely. Um, Larry had a chance to speak twice. There was a sister on this mic who wanted to speak before the question was called. She should have been given that opportunity. Yep. And I will say, brother, I totally neglected or missed that Larry had spoken the first time around. It wasn't until the parliamentarian did remind me of that. 
I do apologize for that one. Um, with the indulgence of the convention floor, I would ask, please, the chair obviously missed something. I would appreciate it if we would allow the sister to have her say to it, which is unorthodox. Thank you for that. I appreciate the indulgement. Sister, would you like to go back to the mic? Where did she go? I apologize to that sister, please. I'm really sorry. It's um, not your fault, it was mine, I missed it. This is my first time at the mic. I want to thank the brother for challenging the chair as well and bringing that to light. Thank you so much for that. It's important we have our say. Sister, when you're ready. My name is Chris Kwan. I'm Social Sciences, Local 7, Area 4, 7. The reason I came up to reject the um, referral was because you're all talking about money. You're talking about what it's going to cost for this campaign. But what you're forgetting is about the cost of life insurance when our colleagues and our members kill themselves. I wear on my arm a reminder of my second colleague that killed himself because of mental health. The first one from Brandon, the second one from Headingley. Although I'm social sciences, I belong to them. And when I trained them, I told them, don't forget to stay together and stay strong. I now live with another jail guard for the last 10 years who's constantly wanting to kill himself. Mental health is huge. We need to stand together. We need to make sure that those people out there who are afraid to say, I'm sick or I don't even know what's happening to me, that it's okay to talk to one another. Don't forget, when they die, there's still payout money. So what is the better cost? Pay for a campaign or pay for their death? Thank you, sister. I will say that it's not the union that does the payout. It doesn't come out of our coffers. And again, sister, just so that the delegates know that it's not the union that does the payout when someone does pass away. Um, and again, looking at something like this, we need to have all of the information. So at no time do I don't, I don't believe that anyone in this room is saying we should not be aware of mental health issues. But if we're looking at a campaign, what kind of campaign, who's involved in it, how much are we going to spend on it? What direction is it going to go? Is it going to be included with workplaces that actually have a challenge in their workplaces? And then do we make sure that we have all of those included? So that would be what your board of directors would be charged with when they're looking at doing the campaigns and how we move forward. And again, thank you, brother, for the challenge to the chair. I appreciate it very much. So again, it has been moved and seconded by committee to refer to the incoming board of directors. Please press one if you're in agreement. Please press two if you're opposed. Is that a 50 percent increase? That is carried. But please note everyone, I think everyone in the room, as well as your vice presidents, the staff that are involved in putting any of this stuff together, we take everyone's workplace issues, everyone's problems that are out there. We know that our members are the ones that provide the best services for those that do have challenges. Mental health is one first and foremost that is front and center in our country right now. We have a prime minister that definitely is looking at it. We will be pushing this provincial government. But again, the Risk and Strategy Committee, your board of directors will definitely be taking into consideration everything that was said here today. Thank you. Back. Okay. I will hand it to Janet. 
you okay. say Jen, point of privilege? Yes. Um, I apologize. I'm not sure if this is uh, kosher with the rules, so stop me if it isn't. But I'd like to add, I'm a community mental health worker, and um, I noticed that one of the other ladies uh, mentioned she was too. I'd like to request for the board, if it's possible, that those of us who are members who have um, experience and education in this area would be able to be involved in the consultation process so that because all the points that everybody has mentioned are really valid and I think that also if uh, we're involved then we can ensure Sorry. that that, that things Sorry. are addressed is that okay. something that can you mention first you have to say your name but secondly, oh, sorry. I think you're Amanda actually, uh, uh, local 420 president I think you're out of order sorry um, okay but 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 if I'm hearing you right what you want is is a a fulsome consultation yeah um, that I'm just volunteering to be part of that and I'm sure that others would would help out as well so yeah I appreciate that yeah. um, so I'm gonna uh, move us forward with our elections there were 336 ballots cast there were zero spoiled ballots a 50% plus one would be 168 ballots to win William White 69 ballots Joe Dooley, 115 ballots. Ed Miller, 152 ballots. So we will vote again. Um, if you could please put Joe Dooley and Ed Miller's names up, we will vote. I have called the balloting committee back. You do it enough times, you'll eventually get it right. So they have a little ways to walk. So Michelle, can I ask the, I'm not gonna tell you which ballot yet. Um, can we ask the general resolutions committee? You guys can probably do another resolution before they return. I do have, I'm gonna do my home screen privilege. I'm gonna provide a little bit of information. Okay. All right, uh, and I'll then we the will go back, back to Michelle. the resolutions. So just an FYI for the delegates here today, I've been handed a note that says there are five or six other campaign requests and at five hundred thousand dollars each we're looking at three million dollars which are three million huh. <laughs> that actually then would uh, that would take a huge chunk out of our defense fund so please know when it gets referred back to the board when there is a financial cost we've got two choices we drain our bank accounts or we raise our dues so those are what the board looks at at all times when we're doing these things and we try to include and ensure that when we do campaigns we're hitting as many target areas that our members are involved in as we possibly possibly can uh, an example i guess was the ems one where instead of it just being ems we brought in the labs we brought in um, the hospital staff we brought in everybody and we had about I, if I remember correctly, there was about 230 different classifications of our members represented in the one ad. It all tied together and it actually won us awards. So we definitely do make sure that we're doing due diligence looking at this and making sure it's there. So know please that your board is definitely on top of this. And I have a sister on microphone three. Just a point of question, Michelle. Um, when these groups are, when you guys are looking at these campaigns, do you consider bringing in other individuals, not just those on the board, to have the discussion with them? Because I think that's what our brothers and sisters are saying is they're frustrated that it's going back to the board and they're not having their say as to what they believe are the important parts. And I think it's important that we bring those um, individuals in to have the discussion. And Kim, definitely, sister, appreciate hearing that, and definitely, you know, we know that. We do either talk to the folks on the board that represent them, or we have brought folks back. Um, and also, I've just been informed, but yes, you know, when it comes time for that, that's one of the pieces that we've done when we do our local meetings, when we talk to the staff reps, we actually have full um, information gathering so again that's another reason why folks should go to their local meetings go to the area meetings share what is going on there go you know make sure that your president going to their your component meetings that they have full information of what is going on and what is needed so that we can make full full get all the information together so thank you for that Kim 
Um, also, Brother Troke just shared with me that when it comes to the Canadian Mental Health, one of the partners that we're looking at is working with the Canadian Mental Health Association as well to be able to talk to them on how we move things forward. All right, with that, I give it back to Janet. Our balloting committee has returned. I will ask the Sergeant at Arms to invite our delegates back in the hall and to tile the doors. Uh, if we could post the names. Oh. Um, and if the Sergeant at Arms can tile the doors, please. They're still open. Closing the doors. Closing the doors. Can we close the doors, please? Can we tile the doors? Hello? Okay. Sorry, speaker at mic three. Short point of order, Madam Chair, Jody Gillis, Local 73. Uh, just wondering, I thought we'd said uh, Resolution 34 would be considered by committee during this process so that we could get to it by the end of convention. It was the one that was, uh, the referral was rejected having to do with gender neutral language. We will get there. Right, we'd said that, I thought it was said that the committee would be allowed to caucus and make a rec recommendation while the voting was going on. Okay. Okay, thank you. So with that, um, we are going to use ballot number three, the bright yellow one, which hopefully the contrast should be good. Can I ask the balloting committee to open the boxes and show them, all our delegates, that the boxes are in fact empty. Again, I will ask uh, once the scrutineers have voted if they could make their way to the back of the hall. And um, one sec. So the General Resolutions Committee, while we're gathering the ballots, is going to take a few minutes to consider the resolution that um, Brother Gillis raised. Have your ballots been collected? And your ballots been collected? Lovely. While the balloting committee is collecting ballots, I'll maybe just mention to folks, earlier a uh, sister mentioned uh, about the budget consultations and I'll just confirm with you that on Thursday, October 25th from 7 to 9 p.m. Um, in the Golden Boy Dining Room uh, at the Legislative is when our pre-consultation uh, will be taking place for those that are interested in attending. And as Michelle said earlier, that information will also be posted on our website and we encourage you to wear your t-shirts. Eric is dancing for us. I think we're almost done. I appreciate the patience of all the delegates. I know it's getting to be a long day and it's such an important responsibility you're all taking on, so thank you for your patience. Have all the ballots been connected? Not quite. Paula, are you all done over there? Paula, are you done over there? You guys are done? Have all the ballots been collected? Okay, I'll ask the Sergeant at Arms to untile the doors. 
We'll excuse our balloting committee. And it looks like our general resolutions committee needs a few more minutes. So, how about them jets? Yes. Will jets go? One, one. Are they actually playing a game today? Are they really? Who does not get? Sister. Uh, sorry, somebody at the mic. That I'm so sorry. It's My apologies. Right. Right. No Speaker problem. at mic one. Amanda LaRougetel, Local 73. Um, I just rise on a point of um, privilege, I suppose. Tell us about this tiling of the doors. I mean, I know it means you close the doors, but why don't you just say, close the doors? <laughs> well, I think it's because it's more about just closing the door. The idea is, is that during that period of time, no one would be allowed to enter or exit the hall, whereas if you just close it, presumably you could go open it to go out. But isn't uh, there some long, isn't it a Mason tradition or something? Um, so clearly you, you know more about this than no, I do. No, I don't. So <laughs> I think so, and that wouldn't be hard, by the way. I don't know if somebody here has the expertise to answer this you know. uh, delegate's question. Oh. Our parliamentarian just Rats, took the opportunity to get know. a little nicotine. Um, <laughs> sorry, Peter. Um, so uh, I can undertake to get you some more information. Speaker at mic one. Uh, Brian Wilson, Physical Sciences Area 4, and this is a point of privilege to the chair. Uh, in the last motion that was debated, I called a question, and when I called the question, the chair corrected a mistake and allowed a sister to speak, and I very much appreciate they did that. Where I raise as a point of privilege, and I'm doing this very respectfully, is following that after the sister spoke, the question has still been called, but as a chair, you still made some comments, and I feel that was out of order. I have no problem with you correcting a mistake to allow the sister to speak, but uh, when you continue to add some comments, which were very well appreciated as what the role of the board was, I feel that that was out of order, and I bring that as a point of privilege. Thanks, Speaker. And if I, if I may, I do appreciate that. And I will say that I'm just a tad nervous because now we're running over time and we've got areas that I have never had to dwell into in the past. So I'm not an expert and I'm learning right alongside of all of the new delegates here for sure and probably some of the seasoned ones as well. But I definitely appreciate hearing that. Thank you and I apologize to the convention. Thank you. Do we have a speaker? Oh, yeah. oh, speaker on microphone four. Yes, uh, Joe, Joe, Joe Breno, Physical Sciences uh, Area 7, uh, Local 40. Anybody here Mason? So then you know, if you are, that the uh, Tyler was a grand sword who was entrusted with uh, not allowing any unauthorized persons in or out when a meeting was going on. So anybody there with uh, son the name of Tyler what a uh, history of a name, the grand sword, the protector of the hall, the protector of those who would make the decisions in that hall who needed to be left alone by the general public and needed protection. So there you go. Awesome. Thank you, Thank yeah. you very much, brother. Amanda, there we are. And anybody named Tyler, know that you're very special. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, speaker on microphone three. Uh, Laura Kalasha, first time speaker, uh, Woo! local 379. In addition to the brother's uh, comment, Wikipedia is awesome. And uh, it is also a, an old English term for the um, uh, keeper of an inn, which is where a lot of Masons used to meet. Thank you very much, sister. Awesome. So the committee, I understand, has made a decision, and the chair of the committee has just gone to make sure that the wording is all being put together. So bear with us, folks, soon.
with it to everything other than it belongs to. Um, I noticed that a few folks are departing the room and I'm not sure if they're coming back or not, but I encourage you all to stay, but I would also remind you if you are leaving because you have to, could you please ensure that you don't leave with your electronic voting device, AKA clicker, um, cause we have to pay for them and they'll be of no use to you, uh, cause they won't work next convention or anywhere else for you. So. If you do have to depart, please ensure you leave your electronic voting device behind, okay? So delegates, I believe we are going to GR 34. And I turn it to the committee. This is exciting. GR 34, we are making an amendment. So we have it up on the screen for you. The MGU will use gender inclusive language. So we're changing neutral to inclusive in all documents, forms, policies, written materials, etc. After consultation with organizations such as the Rainbow Resource Center regarding appropriate gender inclusive terminology. In addition, the MGU will endeavor to use gender inclusive language when speaking about or to members. This includes, but is not limited to convention and our, our new committee recommendation is to accept as amended the note we didn't get up there, but we wanted to note that we want to ensure that any language chosen by the union for our communication is appropriate and inclusive. So moved. And second. All right, so we have an amended uh, GR 34 that's been moved and seconded by committee. And I see a brother on microphone three. James Alexander, Local 14 Corrections. I don't disagree with it. I know I'm standing at a con mic, but for a very specific reason. Um, we use terms of endearment here, sister, brother. These aren't gender neutral terms. I would hate for those to get taken away from the union movement. So I think that's something that should be specifically called out as we, us not wanting to lose. Thanks. Thank you for that, brother. Duly noted. <laughs> Seeing a sister on microphone one. Is it apropos to request a friendly amendment? Just to, in wording? Sure. Or, if, yeah. you're if you're making an okay. amendment, you have the right, sister. So then it's just in the language. We don't have to say gender inclusive language. We can just say inclusive because that's, there's also gender and sexual diversity and we can just say inclusive. Thank you so very much. Do we have a seconder for that friendly amendment? Actually, we would just consider it friendly and allow it to okay. go without having a motion. The committee that. is going to accept that as friendly and we won't need to go with the motion on it then. Duly noted and thank you very, very much, sister. Taking out the word gender. Sister on microphone one. I'm Jane Geisel, um, area seven, I think, local 73. And I'm a first time speaker at the mic. Ooh, welcome. I just have a thought about uh, the language use at convention that was mentioned previously. And I appreciate that the use of brother and sister is meant as a friendly and um, welcoming terminology. But I think by definition, because it's, uh, it is a gender binary, it does exclude. And so I think that there are other terms that we can use that would be equally friendly. I appreciate the language very much in the um, resolution that speaks to convention. Um, I, I know that with some of my fellow delegates, we'd been saying, even saying friend is um, um, noting the connection that we have with each other and uh, is, has nothing to do with whether um, I identify as cisgender or not. So I think that um, 
there are better ways and other ways that we can move forward with the times and still recognize the connection that we have here in solidarity as the, at the union. Thanks. Thank you very much, sister. And I believe that's why they're including the Rainbow Society. But thank you so much for that. Recognizing the sister on microphone one. Shelly Wiggins, Local 43 Social Sciences. Just to echo what the sister said, and thank you for bringing that up. When I was at the Prairie School for Union Women um, this year, I actually took the Becoming an Ally course, and part of what they talked about in doing inclusive language was allowing people to express what their personal pronouns were, and that in that way, with the brother who really wants to keep the term brother, we can use that for him, but for the... Um, our siblings and friends who don't feel comfortable with that language, that we can use language that they are comfortable with when we're referring to them. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Seeing no others for the man that doesn't talk. Okay. Sure. Brother on microphone one. It's Miller, Gullicle Director, Board. I agree with what's going on here. I mean, the gender parity, the brother sister. Would the, would the terminology cousin be offensive to anyone? I would suggest anyone that wishes to use a terminology that is safe and neutral, try cousin. It covers both sides of this, the realm and it's for everyone. Have you met my cousins? No. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, I have. <laughs> Thank you for that, brother. Not for me. And there's reasons for me why I wouldn't, but you know, so, but it, you know, it's thoughts, right? Wanting to be as respectful as we possibly can for everyone that is involved in our union around the world, period, never mind. Um, I have a sister on microphone three. Call to question. Ah, thank you. Do we have, if the question's been called, do we have a seconder? Microphone three, give uh, your name for it. Laura Kalisha, Locals 379, seconded. Thank you very much. The question's been called. All those in favor of calling the question, please press one. Those opposed, please press two. Questions called. Thank you very much. That's carried. So all those in favor of accepting the amended resolution of GR 34, all those in favor, please press 1. All those opposed, please press 2. That is carried. Thank you very, very much. Awesome. All right. Shelley would like to address. Please. I would just like to say thank you to the convention floor for allowing us to address that appropriately so that you had the ability to feel heard and that we can move this forward as well, which is something we necessarily do need to do. Thank you. We are still awaiting our balloting committee and our speaker is out with the balloting committee. I'm going to ask for, we have the budget that has been tabled, we need to lift it. What's here? Oh, it's here. What's here? Kevin. Okay. It's here. <laughs> If I, if I could ask the Finance Committee to please come up and be prepared. Step, oh, I'm stepping down the General Resolutions Committee. And again, thank you very much. That's a lot of work that's put together for this. Thank you so much.
Uh, for your fourth vice president, there were 327 ballots cast. There were six spoiled ballots. The results were Joe Dooley, 134, Ed Miller, 187. Ed, I declare you the fourth vice president. Congratulations. Recognized speaker at mic three. Miller, board, Gallico. I want to thank all the members of delegates that were here today and stayed. I want to thank for their patience, their support, and their confidence in me. And finally, I can get these pants off. <laughs> Speaker at mic four. Yeah, hey Ed. Le Ed. Hi. I want to make it unanimous and give you all my votes. With that, I would like to ask all of the candidates who were successful today in running for provincial office to come and join me um, up here. And while they do that, I'll tell you why. Um, they're not quite all here. While they're making their way to the stage, could I have a motion to destroy the ballots? Speaker at mic three. Call this Brandon University. I uh, make that motion to destroy the ballots. Thank you. Speaker at mic three. Larissa, uh, 73, I second it. Thank you very much. All those in favor, push one. If you oppose, push two. That's carried. We'll have the ballots destroyed. I will unlock our balloting committee. Um, the reason I've asked the successful candidates to come forward is a few months ago at a board meeting, your board decided that all of those who take um, a position on the board of directors should take an oath of office. And so your four provincial, pardon me, five provincial officers will take their oath today in front of the delegates. The rest of your new board members will take their oath of office at their first board meeting in November. And I'm just going to get their cards ready. One, two, three, four, five. So can you hand those out to us? So. <laughs> we're going to read it all. We'll read it all together. Okay. All together at okay. the same time. Just insert your name. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, late Lord, in the day, so everybody's a jokester, right? Uh, okay, so let's start. I, I shall go to school, and solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution, all laws, all policies, and procedures of the management of the government of the general of the Union, to the commencement of the country, to the faithfully and impartially discharge the responsibility of this position to the best of my ability. Congratulations to you all. So that concludes my portion of the event. Thank you so much for your patience with me. Um, we have t two important items that we have to do before you folks leave today. And Michelle, I will turn the chair back to you. Okay. I don't have a budget in front of me, so I'm going to rely on you folks. 
So now I'm going to ask for the budget to be lifted from the table. Uh, moved and seconded by the committee that we uh, lift the budget from the table. It has been moved and seconded by committee to lift the budget from the table. Speaker on, micro on microphone two. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Seeing no speakers, all those in favor, press one. Those opposed, please press two. I caught that, Brent, and I love that. Thank you. <laughs> that is carried. The budget's been lifted. Over to Doug. Speaker on microphone two. Thank you, Madam President. <laughs> Diana Schultz, Local 410, Tech Croft Component Director and Board. I would move that the honoraria for the provincial officers not be increased for the 2018 to 2020 term. It has been moved, and I believe it's at the officer's request. That, is that there, there be no increase to the honorarium. I'm looking for a seconder. I have a sister on microphone four. Deb Jamerson, legal to, uh, board, and I second that motion. Thank you very much. Seeing no speakers at the mics, all those in favor of the, the motion. Not, uh, all those in favor of not increasing the honorary at the request of the officers. Please press one. <laughs> okay. If you're opposed, please press two. That is carried. Thank you very much. Turn over to the committee, please. Thank you. Uh, one of the final things we do before the close of convention is uh, have the uh, convention floor approve the budget for the uh, following year. So it is moved and seconded by committee that we adopt the, uh, the budget uh, as presented. So it's been moved and seconded by committee to accept the budget as presented. Seeing no speakers going to the mics, all those in favor, press one. Those opposed, please press two. That is carried. Thank you very much. Step down the Finance Committee. Yep. Thank you so very much. Yes. Now, before I go to Joe, we still have a guest that hasn't had an opportunity yet to be able to speak. So as long as you're not doing an adjourn adjournment, brother, if you are, I'm going to ask you to hold <laughs> off on that one for a minute. Do I know Joe or do I know Joe? And is Kevin... Oh, thank goodness. All right. Oh, sorry, Deb. Uh, speaker on microphone one. Legal Local 26, Deb Jamerson Board. I refer back all the resolutions that have not been dealt with to the incoming board to deal with. Thank you very much. There's been a motion to refer any other resolutions that have not been dealt with yet. I'm looking for a seconder. Brother on microphone three. I guess not. I'll second that. Len Van Roon, Local 133, Mentor Museum. Thank you. All right. Thank you so very much, Len. So it has been moved and seconded to refer all unfinished or un, unresolved resolutions to the incoming board. Point of personal? Yes, brother, on mic three. Uh, I just need a, a clarification. 
that last motion that came from the floor to freeze the honorarium, can we actually put motions from the floor direct? Sorry, Brent, uh, Local 431, Southern EMS superintendents. It's a very good question. I know it all has always been that the honorarium does get brought forward from the board uh, passed it as well. I'm looking at my parliamentarian. So, brother, it, it is part of the agenda, and the parliamentarian says what would happen normally is that it could be referred back to the committee to go join, make a recommendation, and then come back. But because the board actually has already passed, that that resolution do come forward, and then the board chooses, like they ask for volunteers to come and bring it to the convention floor. And because it's part of the agenda, again, it can be brought forward. Okay, because <clears throat> not knowing it was coming forward, it came so quickly, didn't get a chance to speak on it. Um, and it'll be probably too late now, but I strongly disagree with the freeze for the honorarium. Uh, just because Pallister has announced freezes to our employees doesn't mean that we follow suit and freeze the honorarium, which is just a minor token for the hours and the dedication that our PTO has put in for our issues that I don't believe that it's our union's best interest to penalize them because the government is attacking us. I think it's time where we stand strong and we believe in our PTOs and our executive to bring those issues forward and a wage freeze for them is not acceptable. Thank you for your thoughts, brother. It was something that was, that was discussed through the board and stuff, and that was something that was thought of as well. So, and I don't want to lose quorum here. Sister on microphone three or two. Hi. We're Schultz. not changing anything. Right, Schultz okay. 410. I just want the floor to be clear that it was the provincial table officers that requested that we do not raise their honorarium. Absolutely. It wasn't something that was a decision basically of the board. It was the four provincial table officers that brought it to the board. It was at their right. request, yep. not from the rest of the board. Thank so you. I want that to be clear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. It, it is my great pleasure to be able to, to introduce Kevin Rebeck once again to the convention floor. Kevin is an awesome brother, a strong, strong, diehard advocate for labor in this province, and uh, very much respected by all of us that know him. So I hope each and every one of you get a chance to know him as well as I know him. Brother Kevin. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so I'm told I have 90 minutes. We'll get things, no. Uh, I thought I would have a bit more time, but I'm aware I'm between you and the end of the day. So I was gonna talk about three main themes. One, a little bit about the MFL. Two, um, something about Bill 28 to bring me up to speed there. And then about the 1919 celebrations next year. So I'm gonna touch on all three of those, but I'm gonna pick up the pace on the MFL piece. I'm gonna pick it up even more on Bill 28, and I'm gonna hit normal speed on 1919. So I'm honored to be here today to bring greetings on behalf of over 100,000 members. The MFL is made up of union members from across the province and we are largely made up of our largest union, you, the MGU. Next slide, please. <laughs> the MFL executive has a number of MGU members on it. Michelle is our executive VP, as well as we have Wayne Shacken, Jean-Guy Bourgeois, uh, we have Kathy Woods, Jill Stockwell, Carol Grant, Ed Miller, Jerry LaBelle, Jesse McNeil, Kirk Carr, Susan Smirchansky, and Liz Dodds. So you are very well represented on our Executive Council and uh, thank you for serving in that role. Next slide. We are the CLC's provincial labor body. We advocate for legis legislative change. We encourage political action, coordinate multi-union campaigns. We work with business, government, labor unions, and social partners to educate the public about issues that matter for working people. Next. We've successfully advanced the legislative agenda with first of its kind in Canada legislation on domestic violence leave. 
through our women's committee. We can hear here. We continue to do education about this because our government is not. So our women's committee have taken out bus benches and done posters and ads and worked with partners to get get that there. Another first of its kind legislation is presumptive PTSD legislation for all workers. So I'm very proud that our province was the first to do that. We know mental health injuries are serious and delays to treatment make things worse and we've moved ahead on that front. Next. We've also helped realize improvements to health and safety, WCB and employment standards legislation. We fought for improved traffic rules around construction sites that make things safer for workers and clearer for drivers. Next. We continue to fight for a living wage as we see our current government indexing a poverty level wage, meaning Manitoba workers are supposed to get by on $11.35 an hour. All around us, governments are recognizing that they need to look at a living wage and $15 is fair. Since government changed, it's been harder, harder on everyone, but particularly on public sector workers and even more so on unionized public sector workers. And shame on this government. Privatization of air ambulance, Pineland nursery, provincial infrastructure work, Churchill liquor store, and more are becoming the norm under this government. Project labor agreements are soon to be illegal. You see that anti Bill 28, well, don't get it confused with the last anti-labor legislation, Bill 28. There's a new Bill 28 that bans project labor agreements from happening in Manitoba. Next. So there is our Bill 28, the one we're more familiar with, the Public Service Sustainability Act. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about where we're at with that. Next, please. If we go back to 2016 of November, uh, I prefer go back to pre-April of 2016 when Pallister wasn't in power. But our tragic comedy begins in 2016 of November. Um, we started uh, going down the road with announcements that they were looking at freezing public sector wages. Next. Before Bill 28 came into existence, he started talking about making sure that the public sector costs don't exceed Manitoba's ability to pay. Next. We then got an invite to meet with government. They only allowed five unions to come. MG was one of them. And we met with them and they had an agenda for us. And they do have an agenda, make no mistake. And the agenda said, number one, we want to talk about getting things back to balance. And that could include, we haven't decided, something like freezing wages or though that might be an option. We want to work with you on that. We also think there's too many unions in health care, too many collective agreements. And we want to talk that through with you. And we're open to ideas on how we can do things. And, uh, and they started the process of going down the road of, uh, of looking at things. They also said um, they played a game with us. You know that game? Two truths and a lie. Have people played this game? I'm going to play it with you right now. Uh, you can tell me which one you think the lie is. Uh, um, I'll give you a hint. It's the first one. So <laughs> they said there's been no decisions made on how they wanted to get things back to balance or on leg labor legislation, and they wanted to consult with us. Number two, they said legislation was a tool available to government. And number three, they said legislation would be introduced in the spring. So they set up consultations. Next. They allowed 10 unions to meet, and when I say consultation, um, there's two definitions of consultation, at least I've learned of. One is consulting with people, and the other is Pallister's version, where they'll have meetings with us. It's pronounced a little differently, as you can see. <laughs> Next slide. Consultation meetings began, and they met, and uh, we said we asked good questions, and we presented a plan to return to balance, and we said we'd like to know. You know, do you have anything drafted? Is there legislation? And they said, no, but government could. We said, all right, if you do, what unions would you look at? Who would be impacted? We said, they said, we don't know. Great, thank you. Uh, then they said, we said, what time frame were you, would you be looking at? You talked about returning to balance over eight years. Are you looking at that? Oh, probably sooner than that, they said. Very specific answers. Then we said, well, what about your financial goal? What are you looking to achieve? What sort of savings? We're prepared to have a genuine conversation with you. And they said, oh, lots. Great, all right. And then we said, okay, well, we gave them a plan uh, and a presentation, and could we get feedback on it? And they said, yes. Next slide. So they thought they were super helpful, and then they had a, a meeting. I, I don't know this for a fact. This isn't a genuine quote, but I imagine. 
they had a discussion and they said, uh, our representative said, that was a great meeting, let's get together again real soon. So we did. Next slide. It was like Groundhog Day, I have to say. <laughs> click. We started meeting, click, and meeting, and asking the same questions and getting the same answers. Uh, we met four times and every time uh, they just said, this has been a great meeting, uh, we need to do things faster, we won't tell you how fast, we won't tell you who will be impacted by it, and we won't tell you um, what it will be involved. But they did play another game with us, so let's try this one out. How about you applaud like crazy, you can go back one, if you applaud like crazy when I get to the one that you agree with. Um, so it's a would you, would you rather game. Would you rather have mandated wage settlements? You know? Would you rather have changes to your member's pension plan? Would you rather have reduced work weeks? Would you rather open existing contracts? Or would you rather uh, freeze wages? Yeah, we didn't applaud either. Next. <laughs> so then they introduced the bill really quickly. Uh, and they brought it forward and they said it's going to cover all public sector workers. It's going to freeze wages for two years and allow no more than 0.75 or 1% in the following years. And that's total compensation, not just wages. Uh, any deal signed after that proc or the introduction of this bill, so it's retroactive to 2017, uh, would be impacted the next time it comes up. So if you just signed a deal and it's not up for four years, then four years from now you'll be captured by this legislation. Next. So they passed it uh, relatively quickly, but they didn't proclaim it. So what the hell does that mean? Well, it means it's a technical law on the book, but it's not enforceable. It's not in effect. It's not actionable yet. All they have to do to do that is meet their cabinet. They have the majority. Uh, they meet one day and announce it's proclaimed and it's done. So it could become a law. Well, why wouldn't you proclaim something like that into a law? Next slide. Because in Nova Scotia, click again, and we can probably click three until you see Pallister's face. Um, they played this game, and they said that uh, uh, they introduced a law and didn't proclaim it that froze wages, and unions were paralyzed, and they couldn't challenge the law until it was proclaimed. But we thought, can we challenge it sooner? And we found out we could. So Pallister was quite shocked, because they didn't play that, that way in Nova Scotia, and I think we stunned them. They're here. Next. Next slide. So the MFL led the charge pulling together over 25 unions who are impacted, representing over 120,000 workers who are impacted by the legislation. And uh, the MGU was the first to do some extra research and reach out to Myers and uh, provide some background. Uh, they've shared that very freely and together as, a, as an organization, we came under the Partnership to Defend Public Services. We hired Myers and built on that initial legal work that was supplied. And we took this government to court and we're taking them on. We've applied for an injunction as well. An injunction is a high bar that you have to meet, but an injunction would say a court decides they can't proclaim the law. It will prevent them from bringing it into law until they rule on whether it's legal or not. Why would it not be legal? Well, we believe it violates our charter rights. We have a charter right to belong to a union. And the difference between belonging to a union or the gym is a union negotiates for you. So by stripping away our ability to negotiate, he's effectively stripping away our right to belong to a union. And that, that sort of argument has worked and unions have won that in the past in the courts. So we brought them up on an injunction. Next, I think. Right, I lost track. There we go. Unfortunately, we didn't win the injunction, uh, but we did have a judge that said, this is an important matter to be tried. There is no clear answer here and he is not certain who's who's in the right, and he wants this settled sooner than later. Now, our definition of sooner and a court's definition of sooner have a big variation. Next slide. But we do have dates set for November 18th of 2019 now. So next November, not this November. It could have taken up to another two or three years to get a court date, so that is sooner. Uh, I know it doesn't feel like it. But we will be in court from November 18th to December 5th, and we'll be trying this question and this issue. Noopji, meanwhile, had provided additional legal research and volunteer work. They have taken issues to the International Labour Organization in the past, a tripartite body of the United Nations that Canada belongs to, that makes decisions and gives rulings. They're not necessarily, they can't penalize or, or overrule what governments have done, but it adds credibility and weight when you're violating UN conventions that you've agreed to. So they have done this before and won. 
they provided the good basis for us to look at filing uh, an ILO complaint. Um, our organization, the Partnership to Defend Public Services, met with all the unions and decided at this time we're not wanting to go down that road. We're going to concentrate 100% of our energy on our main court case and get that all lined up in a row. And we're working with legal counsel for the right timing that we might also pursue that. But I do want to give a special thank you to Mewchi for uh, laying the framework for us to initiate that sort of challenge. So thank you. Next. Um, I think that brings us up to speed with where we're at on the legal challenge. Bring up this slide. There we go. Uh, so things have been really challenging in our province, uh, and it really reflective of challenges that we faced here in the past. And 100 years ago, uh, something amazing happened in Winnipeg. And it didn't happen, uh, no one had the idea of the scope of what was happening as it occurred. But I want to give you the, the Reader's Digest version of what happened. So uh, we've been meeting for five years now, we can just go to the next one, uh, to talk about it. In, in 1919, it was after the Russian Revolution, soldiers were coming back to Winnipeg, people were hoping they'd find work and they weren't. Uh, the job market had not kept up. Profits had been made by companies, but had not been shared with workers. In fact, the cost of living had gone up 64% in the six years leading up to strike, and wages had not kept pace. People weren't making ends meet. They couldn't get a living wage. There was very little in terms of uh, labor legislation, if any at all, and there was very weak employment standards in health and safety. Next. So, uh, the metal workers were striking to, for union recognition. They wanted to bargain collectively because they know when we bargain collectively and we stand together, we do better. So they were fighting for that right and recognition and employers were denying them that. And they were frustrated and they tried for months to get recognition and to be able to work together and employers disallowed it so they went on strike. But they knew they couldn't win that strike alone. It was a strike about fair wages. It was a strike about solidarity. It was a strike about... Uh, respect in the workplace and recognition of unions. So they reached out to the Trades and Labour Council, which is the precursor to the Winnipeg Labour Council, where 11,500 union members belonged. And they had a vote. It took time because they had to come in and physically, and people voted. All 11,500 people voted. And 11,000 said, yes, we will go on strike with you. Even though it's not going to affect us at our employment, the example you're setting is important, and we will risk our jobs and our wages to strike for your right to respect in the workplace. As is often the case today and was the case back then, the first to strike in solidarity were the Hello Girls, which was their job title at the Manitoba Telephone System. And they unplugged their last call and walked out. And workers, union and non, were frustrated. They were mad. They had been left behind. Next slide. So by 11 that morning, even though there were only 11,500 unionized workers in the province, or in the, in the city, 30 to 50,000 workers walked off the job, standing in solidarity with workers to fight for respect in the workplace and union recognition. Woo! We've never seen solidarity like that since. For people who don't even have the protection of a union, no guarantee that they have a job to come back to, to come back to that job and, and work again. It was a very strong strike and a strong demonstration with huge public support. Everything ground to a stop. Postal services. Someone made a joke about the elevator the other day, but elevator operators, they had them then. Uh, grocery stores, waterworks, factories, and more. Next, please. It was a national event as well. It caught the imagination of the country. And other cities went on sympathy strikes in support of what we were fighting for and standing up for here in Winnipeg. Brandon, Calgary, Edmonton, Saskatoon. Victoria and others went on strike in solidarity and we had the, uh, the camera lens of the world upon us. Next. The police voted to go on strike and the strike committee asked them, no, we need police services, please continue to serve. So they did, but their hearts were with the strikers. And as the strike progressed, the federal government got involved and sent someone and the mayor came uh, and, and met and they changed definitions of sedition and then they fired the police force because they didn't trust them because they were on the side of strikers and they replaced them with the specials. They armed them with an armband and a wagon spoke or a bat and they sent them in the streets to keep union members in line. Next, please. So, not, surprise, not surprisingly, on June 10th, a riot broke out after the specials were dispersing a crowd. On June 16th, 
They started locking up labor leaders. They came at midnight and knocked on their doors and, and uh, hauled them away uh, to Stony Mountain Penitentiary. And then they started banning speeches and gatherings. And on Saturday, June 21st, war vets organized a silent parade to protest the restrictions on free speech. Next. That's now known as Bloody Saturday. It's the day a streetcar operated by scab labor purely to agitate striking workers and people who've gone six weeks without a paycheck, came around the corner, got tipped over and set on fire. And that was the excuse needed for mounted police to charge through the crowd, fire shots, kill two workers, one on the spot, one a few days later in gangrene. With 34 wounded that we know of, many people didn't report their injuries for fear of being identified as being there and arresting 96. So some say, so you lost, because the strike ended shortly after that. Some say that, but we won. We won political action. We won support for unions like we've never seen before. We empowered and engaged the public in every set of elections, civic, provincial, and federal. Labor leaders were elected to public office, some while still in jail. And we changed things. We set the first ever federal minimum wage at 25 cents an hour. And we set the framework for the Employment Relations Act, Labor Relations Act and Employment Standards, health and safety that we have today. So I want to thank those workers who went on strike 100 years ago for being leaders. <laughs> and I want to celebrate next year and I want you to join me in some big ways. Next again. We've got four large events. One is the Myers LLP Social at the Ukrainian Labor Temple, which was the strike headquarters at the time. Two is the Manitoba Building Trades Gala Dinner with Steve Patterson uh, and the Danny Kramer Band providing some entertainment for us. Three is the UFCW Parade and the QP Family Concert that's got WCB Safety Tent and MHCP Food Court, MTS Family Center. It's going to be a great day on May 25th. And four, the MGEU Concert on June 8th. A generous sponsor to help make this happen. We've got a Building a Better World academic conference and more information of that will be coming out to your union and we're hopeful to get 100 union members or more in attendance with academic community and community activists to talk about what we could learn from the strike in the past to build a better world today. We've got monuments, a tipped over streetcar that will be across from, Main, uh, across from City Hall on Main Street. It'll be a permanent memorial and I think a place many people will want to have their selfies taken, leaned up and pushing that streetcar over and one that's already unveiled. We've got a movie, Strike, the musical. Filming has been finished. I know some people are extras in the movie and have, have been there. Uh, and that will be released on the anniversary of Bloody Saturday next year at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. And thanks to the Canadian labor movement, every grade 11 class will get copies of it. We'll, here, here. we'll have exhibits at the Manitoba Museum, the Canadian Museum of Human Rights, Strike Tours, We'll have conferences and conventions coming in, including Noopchi's conference that will be here, or Noopchi's convention here in Winnipeg next year. We've got shirts and sweaters and jackets you can order online if you visit the MFL website. We're partnering with Little Brown Jug 1919. That was a fun call to make. We've got an event with the Labour Choir. We've got uh, newsletters coming out, a firefighter museum display, and at least four books that will be coming out. Uh, we've got a volunteer program and we're going to need volunteers to make all this happen and we're looking for people to step up and say they'll play a role. We'll assign certain days and duties, but we're looking for help. Next. Uh, none of this comes cheap. It's a budget of 850000 but we've got pledges over 650000 to date and we're very confident that we can achieve that goal. We've got huge sponsors, MGU being responsible for being one of our largest sponsors. They've leaned on Nupchi and Opsu to help. Uh, make that a reality as well. Next. And uh, really that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. I am thrilled and excited that we're going to have so many activities. We've got people from across the country looking to come to Winnipeg, looking to celebrate with that strike. We're looking at events in Brandon. They're looking at doing some sites in solidarity in other cities as well. And I invite you to be part of all of those festivities, to volunteer, and to keep up the incredible work you do as union activists every day. We don't celebrate our victories enough. Thank you so much.
Thank you very, very much, brother. Now, before everybody scrambles for the door, I've been informed that the last vote we did didn't get recorded, so we must redo, I'm afraid. So, we're going back to, which one was it? To ref yes, the motion to refer all back. The motion still stands by Debbie. It is still seconded by Len. So now I'm going to ask folks, seeing no speakers at the mics, please press one if you're accepting the motion to refer or the uh, resolutions left back to the board of directors. Please press one. If you're opposed, please press two. Joe, get ready. It is carried. Thank you. The next item on the agenda was good and welfare. I'm not seeing anybody at the mics. I know the banquet dinner is almost ready, and I understand they have a wee bit of tequila for me. So on that note, I recognize the brother on microphone for... Motion to adjourn. Your name, brother. You need to state oh. your name. Joe Dooley. Donnie. Motion to adjourn. Thank you all very much. Please be safe. See you at dinner. Oh, reminder, please take your clickers, drop them off at the registration desk. Oh, and your uh, evaluation sheets as well, if you could drop them off. Thank you very, very much, everyone. It has been an exciting three days.